This is a panel episode discussing the specifics around the Twitter banning of Milo Yiannopoulos, whose name I can't seem to pronounce consistently. His Twitter ban came after Leslie Jones from the new Ghostbusters film was a recipient of truly horrendous racist attacks. Milo was not explicitly racist to her himself, but certainly downplayed it, encouraged it according to some. Does being a nasty person deserve a Twitter ban? Hmm. That's half of Twitter, so not in my view. Especially considering that nasty, horrible, and hateful are very subjective depending on who you ask. People say that about me because I criticize their religion. And hey, relevant to the subject, I mention my multiple social media bans even in the intro of my podcast. But is a ban on atheists, ex-Muslims, the same thing as Milo's ban? Is there a line that shouldn't be crossed? Is there a difference between personally attacking people and attacking ideas? Is there a technicality they got him on? Is Twitter fair and consistent in how it applies those policies? And most importantly... Is there some terrible conspiracy on liberal social media platforms to silence poor conservative voices? Is this a free speech issue or is the free Milo hashtag just right-wing social justice warriors mirroring the behavior they despise in the left? We ask all these questions and more in this discussion. As a side note, I have to say I'm kind of afraid to open myself up to the barrage of hate that comes with daring to speak out or critique the Milo types. But I'm really not that important, so I hope it won't be too bad. Fingers crossed. Make sure that uh, that program doesn't contain controversial subjects and uh, you're not impolite to people. No, definitely not, Dad. You know me. I'm never, (laughs) ever controversial. Or yeah, 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 okay. Welcome to Conversations with your lovable, never pisses anyone off, never been banned from Facebook or YouTube, never been sabotaged or censored for politely expressing a difference of opinion, ex-Muslim host Ina, keeping it non-controversial. Welcome to the second panel episode of Polite Conversations. Today I have with me Travis Wester. Hello. Hello. And you may know Travis from Eurotrip and 90210. He's an actor. He tells me in LA this is not special, but I'm kind of excited. And I also have Eli Bosnick, comedian, podcaster, and co-host of God Awful Movies and Scathing Atheist. Hi, Eli. Oh, thanks for having me, Ina. Thanks for being here, both of you. This is going to be a fun conversation. We're going to talk freedom of speech and social media bans. One of everybody's favorite people has been banned recently off of Twitter. So let's talk about it. Milo being banned from Twitter. How do we feel? One of you is firmly on the, yes, he should be banned side. One of you is firmly on the, no, he shouldn't be banned, freedom of speech and all that stuff. And I'm kind of in the, well, I initially started off in the the middle totally. Like I kind of get both sides. And as a person who's constantly, constantly banned from social media, because I criticize religion, specifically one religion, um... I understand how sometimes social media bans can be misused and be unfair. Like I've been, my podcast has been banned from YouTube twice. Um, My Facebook page has been disabled twice. Now I'm on a year, so far it's been a year, the longest Facebook ban that I've been on. And all because somebody didn't like what I was posting, so they reported me. They couldn't really report the content because... I guess, I mean, I'm not really saying anything wrong or abusive, so they always get me with the uh, real name uh, policy that Facebook has, um, which, I mean, I use a pseudonym for the simple reason of wanting to stay alive. So I think there's lots of reasons why people could use pseudonyms and Facebook should really reconsider. But anyways, what are your thoughts on this ban? Travis? 
Uh, well, I think, uh, first of all, it's important to differentiate between the foundational principle of liberalism and the First Amendment, because I think uh, right after Milo was banned, I, I, I saw a lot of people <clears throat> on the political left uh, pointing out that Twitter was a private company and they had every every you know right to to do what they're doing and um that the freedom of speech that that you know and people kind of were conflating the two they were saying like well freedom of speech just means that the government can't 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 tell you what to say or can't silence you and that's true to a certain extent but you know the the thing is is freedom of speech is more than just the first amendment the first amendment is a legal concept that keeps the government uh out of the speech area entirely, uh, which is right and proper. And, you know, it's obviously one of the, it's the font from which most other freedoms in our society flow. Uh, But freedom of speech is also a concept and it's an ideal. Uh, It's a virtue. It's sort of like, um, uh, love thy neighbor as thyself, right? That's not, that's not codified in any particular law that I'm aware of, but it's a general principle that, you know, people might want to try to live by. I think it was Evelyn Beatrice Hall who paraphrased Voltaire by saying, I disapprove of what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. Mm-hmm. And I think in, you know, in our society, that while there might be people whose speech we find repulsive and repugnant and objectionable, we still have to allow them to say it because I think there is a slippery slope argument you could make that where if you, you know, if you start restricting speech and you start shutting people down, down, even if it's not the government, even if it's just, you know, this sort of censorship by fiat of the, the sort of mob mentality, you still run into this slippery slope of like, okay, well, who gets to determine what speech is quote unquote hate speech and what speech is orthodox? So I think in silencing Milo and in banning Milo, what Twitter did is they declared themselves partisans in this culture war. And I don't know if that was either helpful in the general conversation or good for Twitter stock price. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I I understand that slippery slope argument and that hate speech is really subjective. Like for some people, hate speech is literally just criticizing their religion. And for some people, hate speech is religion, right? Like I think religion is pretty damn hateful and commanding the death of people, slavery and okaying rape and shit. Like pretty hateful, but I I'm against banning religion, right? So I guess I'm against banning that form of hate speech. So I kind of get what you're saying, but Twitter, again, is not is not the government, and this is the distinction that you're talking about creating, right? And, and I want to give credit to Travis here, because I think eventually we will disagree, but, you know, as much as I would love Travis to come on and be like, they violated his First Amendment rights, I think that at the highest level, there's a couple of things that we need to acknowledge, which is the first is that both sides of this conversation want a better world for the people involved. Now, obviously, I have my opinions as to how that is, and I think Travis has his, but we both want a better world, and both people, both sides tend to project onto the other side, this sort of villainous, either Nazi-esque, you know, let's silence the minority mm-hmm. and let's let these hate speech, you know, run rampant. And then on the other side is this sort of, you know, regressive left shutting down every opinion they disagree with. So, you know, first, let's just think about how fantastic it is that Travis comes on and automatically acknowledges that this isn't about the First Amendment. And if you're listening to this and you were under the impression up until now that it was, you just lack education. And that's totally fine. It's totally (laughs) fine to lack education. But like, That's not what this conversation is going to be about. And what hate speech means under the First Amendment is very, very clearly defined. And I recommend checking out um, Andrew Torres' episode on Atheistically Speaking about hate speech because that's a really interesting definition of, of what that means legally. I think what we're talking about here, and again, more and more credit to Travis, is about freedom of speech. And yeah, but even legally, though, sometimes that hate speech definition can be problematic. Like there was, that, I forget exactly what the bill number was and where it was going on. I think 
in Europe uh, that the, the Twitter has now uh, agreed to no, no, go no, no. by this the... is not, not Twitter related, but this was about religion and uh, anyone criticizing Islam or something something like that what could, could legally be held accountable for hate speech. And this was worrying to ex-Muslims like myself because... I mean, our existence then is hate speech, right? What the hell do we do? Like, a, or even like a gay person, why would they not criticize a homophobic ideology? That that's their right to call it hate speech to criticize something like that. If I can jump in here really quick, I think that's kind of yeah, that's the sort of the area that I'm talking about, and I don't want to swerve the conversation too far away from Milo and Twitter just yet. But um, you're absolutely right. In, in Europe, uh, in England, I've, I mean, I'm, I'm just speaking off the top of my head, but I know that I've seen stories of someone being critical of Islam on Twitter and not 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 being hateful necessarily in my opinion not being hateful and not being uh, too venomous just kind of calling into question uh, some of the things that are going on in their country and they get a knock at the door from the authorities and I'm not exactly sure that that is either liberal or a world that I particularly want to live in. Well, more importantly, Facebook and Twitter both agreed to abide by certain hate speech regulations that are active in Europe, which are incredibly problematic. And again, we're not going to, I promise I'm not going to spend the whole time on this side of the argument, but I actually held the opposite view. I was like, oh no, they're never going to have, this isn't going to be a problem. And while I do have to admit that up until this point, both Facebook and Twitter have not acted on those uh, slightly more vague and slightly more problematic hate speech for in Europe uh, in any way that I would consider problematic. The fact that they've agreed to does cause a lot of people to worry. I think in that realm, we can actually talk about, okay, when it comes to legal consequences, especially legal consequences for private companies for not abiding by laws that perhaps we all agree or all but a few of us agree are really problematic, you know, quite literally violating the First Amendment, you know, in the way that we're talking about, um, I can understand the worry here. It's very important to clarify that that's not what we're talking about when we talk about Milo. What we're right. talking about when we talk about with Milo is we're talking about a private company and their decision to ban a user. And there's, there's three points that I've heard brought up sort of in favor of Milo. Uh, the first is, and this is every think piece starts with this, and it's just baffling to me, but the, every think piece starts with, I don't know much about Milo Yiannopoulos and what he does. And I'm just like, well, I feel like you shouldn't write a piece defending <laughs> just him, Google right? him, man. Yeah, Google him first before you write the piece defending him. The second is about um, egalitarian punishment. Uh, you know, how come Milo got kicked off when XYZ still stands? The Ayatollah, right, and still stands. And that's something I hear from Muslim apologists all the time defending Islam. Well, how come you won't criticize Christianity? And that argument really annoys the shit out of me. But anyways, continue. Uh, and the third one, and, and this is the one that sort of gets, I think, to the core philosophical disagreement that I think we're going to have, which is what counts as a public marketplace for speech. Because I think we all agree, and Travis, jump in, interrupt me, tell me I'm wrong if I am. I think we all agree if Milo went to a restaurant that has about 150 million people in it, and he and about 1.2 of his two million of his friends sat down at a table and saw Leslie Jones sitting at another table, and Milo makes some jokes, and then all of a sudden people start throwing bread rolls at her, and people start screaming at her, and people start Can coming I on pictures of her face and sending her those pictures. I think we all agree agree it would be that restaurant's prerogative to ask him to leave so uh, I think okay so this is the time where I, where, where I will jump in um, and yep. you're absolutely right uh, the, the restaurant would have a right to do that if they applied that rule to everybody but what right? about the people they don't see it they had like one guy in one corner yeah they they should be applying it equally absolutely yeah, I don't disagree but they, but they but don't lose the ability to apply their rules and regulations because they fail to do it some of the time that would be like saying you can't give out speed tickets because there are no because there are murderers walking free like that that doesn't change how can rules I just work ask or, uh, Travis yeah. are you a fan of uh, Milo 
You know, I, 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 I agree with a lot of what he said, like almost a disturbing amount of what he says. But then, you know, I get into his other the, some of the other things that he talks about as far as religion and as far as abortion and as far and especially on, in any economic area. I think I think the only I think we're encountering a very interesting moment in political history where we're seeing a realigning of the political axis from mm-hmm. the left right spectrum into the sort of the, this up and down spectrum between authoritarianism and, liber- and liberalism. And um, so, I, you know, I, I agree with what he says in the in the area of, um, you know, be, you know, being able to be provocative, you know, being able to um, challenge and being able to insult and being able to, you know, be um, to be. I don't want to use the word rack on tour because that's overused. And but what silly, about but- the view? Not just him being able to, but what about what about <laughs> his views? Like him thinking that feminism is cancer or that whatever shit he says about trans people. Or yeah, that, that trans people are mentally ill and shouldn't be accommodated. Christianity but is amazing. Or lesbians don't exist. I, I, just because, like, when you say I agree with some of the things he says, I don't want people to be like, oh, you agree with Miles? Right, trans so what, people are what do you agree Ill. with? Right. Well, I think it's important to kind of circle back around to the, the you know, the quote, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. I don't I get I that, think, but that's I, I think not you, what I think I'm asking. Can, I think you can disagree with every single thing that Milo says, but still see how banning him on how Twitter banning him is problematic, not from a legal First Amendment standpoint, but just from a purely aspirational uh, liberal standpoint. Okay, but do you what do you agree with with him? Uh, well, I agree. I, well, I agree with him that it was wrong for him to be banned from Twitter. But that's I, I it. don't particularly. I don't particularly want to get into the ins and outs of you know what I agree with or don't agree with because I don't want to get off into the weeds. I, I don't want. This isn't a, a referendum on on Milo Yiannopoulos. Right, right. But okay. So generally, just trying to understand where you're coming from. Like, do you agree with his views? Are you a fan of his? Um, and do you consider him lib- liberal? Also, we just don't want to set you – I mean, I personally don't want to set you up for someone to think that you support ideas that you don't. I know how the internet especially can be and what's what we're talking about. And, like, you seem like a super-duper sweet person, and the last thing I want is someone to walk away from this conversation thinking you hold hateful beliefs that you don't. I think that's why you're getting a little bit more concrete push from us about one of Milo's do you agree with. Uh, not, not to try you and corner you, but just really to – specific, but generally yeah. I want to know where you're coming from. Like, if you're a fan – of his, I, then- got, well, I, I value his voice in the public space, and I, I think that you know, I think the one of the principal problems that we're encountering, I think you know, I think you see it in the American Academy. I think you see it in, uh, obviously, you see it on Twitter, is a lack of diversity, not racial or ethnic or gender diversity, but you see a lack of intellectual diversity. Uh, I, I, when we start when we start dismissing people from Twitter based on them holding unpopular opinions or beliefs that we ourselves find contemptible, um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, I, if I, someone... think, I think when we start we start bleeding out, we, you know, when we start when we start sacrificing that intellectual diversity. No, I mean, um, you cannot just like say respect everyone because that's really what holding people accountable for their views is. Like, if there's something I'm going to judge people on, it's not their looks, it's not how much money they make. It's really their ideas. It's not their race or whatever. It's their ideas. And if I find their ideas morally repugnant, I will judge them on that, unfortunately. And I can still see um, maybe, maybe a kind of case, though. Like, I find him repulsive. But Mm. do I support his ban? In some ways, no. In some ways, yes, because... uh, no, I don't, because I don't want him further empowered. He seems to be enjoying this. He's like, this is perfect timing. I've been preparing for this. I love this. I don't I don't want him to be more empowered than he already is. Oh, I think he's a I, dangerous person. I know. I'm yeah. going to completely disagree with you there. It is... It is the least empowering thing that could happen to him. It is now a countdown until Milo is forgotten. He, he used Twitter excellently to promote his brand of vitriol and hatred. And now that he is off of it, um, he will fade from our consciousness. I mean, he just will. Breitbart's a rag oh, filled with know. lies. I, hope, I, I wish you were right, I, but I can't agree with that. I'm, I'm so glad we're recording. A year from now, the relevance of Milo Yiannopoulos will be 
laughable if his Twitter ban stays, which which I believe it will. But Travis, I want to bring you back to this metaphor of the restaurant. Well, real quick, I'm, can you, oh, no, can go ahead. Can you put a yeah, real quick, because I do kind of want to address uh, this point. I, uh, Eli, I, I'm, I am glad you're recording it too, because uh, I, I want to go on record and, as as also completely disagreeing with you on that point. I, to me, you sound like uh, like the you know like the the pundits and stuff about a year ago that were saying, oh, a year from now, Donald Trump, we're not, mm. he's going to be you know, and we're going to be voting between Jeb and Hillary and and uh, and and here we are talking about Donald Trump still. Um, I think with, with Miley Yiannopoulos, I think you know this is Twitter's version of. Um, uh, I forget what it was called, but it was Rule One when Bremer came into Iraq and he just our Iraqi army. Um, you know, I think you know when when you ban Milo, you're giving him you know this extra cachet of power, and uh, you know I, I think you know if you wanted to if you wanted to kind of mute Milo Yiannopoulos. Uh, doing something like this only shines a spotlight on him and what he's saying. Uh, so I, I, you know, that's, I, I, that's I, the I, one I'm gonna, thing. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna have to. I'm just gonna have to uh, disagree with you on that point. And and, yeah. and hopefully, yeah, and hopefully, hopefully, a year from now, we'll both be on Twitter and we can, and, and and I hope that you're telling me I told you so. That's oh it. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I mean, here's the thing: it, his ban may not last. A new forum which allows him to still reach his audience may exist. In which case, I will freely admit now uh, that he will absolutely still be part of public consciousness. And yes, Travis, to to your point, and I, it, it's important to be intellectual honest and admit right now we have shown a big spotlight and painted him as a victim right he yeah. now gets to sit on his website which again is filled with hatred and lies and vitriol and go woe is me thus comes the end you know i now i am death creator of worlds or destroyer of worlds right he gets <laughs> to do that now and he'll do that and he'll do a tour of all the think piece neocon youtube shows slash radio shows where they'll have him on and he'll be like yes don't you think it's terrible they banned me and everyone will go yeah it's terrible they banned you. But eventually, his fans do not have the attention span. The people who support him do not have the attention span to stay with someone if they are not currently attacking and creating a hateful environment. Oh, but they you're will simply move on. Underestimating Eli. There's YouTube. There's Facebook. There's a dozen other ways he can get himself Daily out. Daily motion. There. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. He certainly might. My point is that by silencing him in this medium, we have made the we have made Twitter. Perhaps this is a better argument, and, and uh, I'm ready for pushback on this. We have made Twitter a better place, and this is what I think we're we're getting to, which is the crux of the philosophical disagreement. Which is, and and you said something really interesting, Travis, which I which I want to come back to. You said that uh, we're we're lacking intellectual diversity, and the argument that I want to make is that what Milo Yiannopoulos has to say is not worth our time on a social level. Now, legally... What, I his genuinely... defense of his pedophile priest isn't worth yeah, exactly. our time? Exactly. you got to be kidding. No. Right, and I mean that. I, his intellectual diversity is not worth our social time. Legally, absolutely. If he were under arrest right now for the thing he said, I oh, would yeah. be protesting or be oh, on yeah, the absolute too. opposite side. But the truth is that when it comes to social consequence, right? Again, bring back to that metaphor of the restaurant. He behaved badly in a restaurant, and whether or not the restaurant enforces its policies equally is irrelevant as to whether or not he belonged there. It is obvious from a cursory look at the way he has behaved, at the things he has said and done, that he does not belong in any space that we wish to make that we wish to make anything but hostile and vitriolic. And if the answer to that is why don't we also kick off the ISIS accounts, I'm a hundred percent with whoever's argument that is. I also want the ISIS accounts kicked off. To me, it just seems like finding him a loophole. Like if he's been taken off for breaking Twitter rules and other people are breaking Twitter rules and he, and they're not taken off. I don't see the need to fight for him then. This is the one thing that tips me over to the side of, yeah, maybe this ban was okay. It's just got okay. nothing to do with whether or not he belongs there. It's, it's just not an argument. Uh, but it's I think you're definitely way harsher on the, like, let's ban him side. Like, you also don't want him to be able to speak at universities and things like that. I think that just gives him what he wants. He, like, he... His enemies are his best um, promoters, right? And my goal is that people like him do not 
get promoted. So that is my interest in letting him spew his hate as much as I hate it. Well, he's but, certainly welcome to spew his hate. The, the issue that I've said, so just to clarify my position on universities, just to be very, very clear, the issue that I have said is I have taken issue with a university having him speak there. As a university, it is part of your job to filter the information, right? In, a, in an active place of ideas, part of your job is to filter information so that your students are in a safe environment. And I, so I'm going to have to jump in right there. I, I Please go ahead. I completely disagree. Mm-hmm. 100% with that notion, I believe, personally. I mean, and, and by the way, full disclosure, I, I was never institutionalized. Uh, I, I, I didn't go through any uh, academy of higher learning. Um, and and to some extent, I'm kind of grateful for that because I feel that... Institutionalized out, is a fun fun way of expressing that. <laughs> um uh, yeah, and and uh, I feel it because because I feel that uh, a lot of people, especially younger people coming out of the the American Academy right now, um, have been, especially in the liberal arts space, have been indoctrinated into a very specific and a very narrow ideological bandwidth. And I do think that it's a university's job to challenge students with ideas that they might not already have, and that and 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 I think sunlight is the best disinfectant. I, I think, think that, it, I agree with I think, Travis totally. Yeah. I think so. Uh, I'm going to point out. A couple- let, me just, let me just let me just wrap no, this up. No, please finish. Sorry, don't let me talk. Um, uh, sh- <laughs> don't <laughs> let me interrupt you on that. No, no. <laughs> yeah, fine, fine, don't let me talk. Uh, Careful, we're going to get into those Scottish and, and French accents here in a minute. Um, uh, but uh, right, so the sunlight's the best disinfectant, and I think that you know owe it to their students to expose them to ideas that they might find distasteful. And I think that if you ban Milo from Twitter, um, instead of holding his ideas up to the sunlight where people can see them and discuss them rationally and, and, and explain you know, the issues and, and you know, the, the, the problems they have with them and, and, and poke holes in the logic and stuff like that, then, you know, then, then, then I think what, what Eli is saying about him, him eventually dissipating will eventually come to fruition. But if he is able to germinate in this sort of dark corner where he's in his own little echo chamber, uh, then that sunlight doesn't, isn't able to, to penetrate and, and, and we're not able to unpack what he's saying in the public space. So let me explain why, why there's there's several examples right now. And the, the best example that disproves that, of course, is Donald Trump, who has been exposed to the maximum amount of quote unquote sunlight. Right. And we have pointed out every time Donald Trump has told a lie. Most of the things that Milo have, Milo has said, not most of the things, sorry, a ton of the lies that Milo spreads have been disproven. Right. What they, they have not reduced his listenership or his viewership or his fan at all. And mm. while I completely agree that we need to be exposed to bad ideas, and that's critical to education, there is a way to expose bad ideas. And the best example I'll give of this is Holocaust denial, right? The way to teach Holocaust denial, the way that we teach Holocaust denial in the university is in a class about the Holocaust, a teacher who is aware of the truth and the facts related to those matters introduces that to students and says, so they say, there's this crazy guy who hates Jews, by the way. He says these cyanide, these bricks didn't have enough cyanide on them. Here's why he's wrong. Here's why he's crazy. This is why this is a bad idea. So you That's want education. to make a distinction between teaching something as fact and just allowing it to be spoken. And teaching it as fact is dangerous. Absolutely. Teaching whatever... Milo spouts as fact that trans people are... Well, we never would. We right. never would. But so right. in the same way that teaching creationism as fact or flat earth theory as fact would be and we would never worryingly say- disturbing and damaging. But if some crazy person wants to come and debate like a science teacher, I think this would be an excellent, excellent discussion on a university campus. Like, I remember going to some really weird talks and loving that how bizarre it was. Oh, but- I have no problem with a debate on campus. If you want to bring David Icke onto a campus to explain why the queen used to be a lizard and is now inhabited by a robot that is run by lizards, and then a person whose brain works normally, to argue that point, all 
day, every day. That is different than the claim that sunlight, quote unquote, kills bad ideas. And and this is what we need to really bear with. And, And this doesn't get addressed enough. What happens when Milo gives a talk on campus? These are children. They are 19 year old babies. And when Milo gives a talk on campus for several thousand people, most people are simply there as a troll movement because they think it's quote unquote funny, because they think it's quote unquote, you know, obnoxious or pushing the but edge listen, or shit. You and I would be there if someone was trolling maybe like a real I don't know, religion, right? And we would think it's funny, like Ricky Gervais mocking religion, I'd be there. And then Christians would be like, oh, well, you know, this is hateful. You're trolling. You're laughing at us. It's a difference because it's a denial of personhood. And and the example I was going to give is this. When Milo goes to a college campus and a 19-year-old trans student sees him give a speech of to 2,000 people saying that they are mentally ill and shouldn't be accommodated, we need to take on the danger that we put that student in. And to say to that student, the answer to that is more speech. Or well, I'm why sorry, can I ask you a question? question? What, what, I'm sorry, but what danger, what danger are you putting that student in? Oh, we, we create an, uns- that child then becomes unsafe in their learning environment. They are well, I told- also, I, also wanna, I also just wanna point out not babies, they're, they're, they're adults. They're adults, yeah. They're, okay, so the, the counterexample to their adults is I could go to Bob Jones University tomorrow and reduce any Bob Jones University student to tears because they're babies and they don't know how to fight back. And nobody here or in the secular community would be like, yeah, Eli, good job. You show that 17-year-old. He didn't know how to counteract problem of evil. We don't argue with the youngest most vulnerable members of our society to our ideas. We argue with people like us who are speaking at the highest level. And the reason why Milo attacks college students and the reason why the new right attacks college students is because when they debate people um, at a higher level of intellect, they're made to look foolish, right? That, that's why they attack 19-year-olds. So to be clear, a 19-year-old trans student, and, and just put yourself in this position. I, I know it's slightly emotional and slightly listen to the world's smallest violin, but, but genuinely this is a real thing that happens, and I think it's important for us to consider. If a 19-year-old walks on campus and sees this talk, and the answer they're given is in the school paper or more speech, we are ignoring the fact that they are largely silenced by hate speech. And there's actually a fantastic paper of research done on this. Um, which is called Power in Public, Reactions, Responses, and Resistance to Offensive Public Speech by Laura Beth Nielsen, which I recommend everybody look up and read, which shows that when people are exposed to this speech, largely, largely to the overwhelming extent, they do not speak up, they do not defend themselves. What they do is they silence themselves and they feel unsafe. Yeah, but I mean, people react differently, right? Like, So if on campus, as a woman of color, if there was like a, a racist coming on, I would actually be interested because I find racists like bizarrely fascinating. Like, how do they even exist in this day and age, right? I just want to hear what he has to say. Of course, it'll be hurtful what he's saying to me. Same way, like with an anti immigrant or, you know, a person who hates feminists. Like, these are all parts of my identity. If they were to say that, uh, you know, a brown person is less human or less intelligent, of course, it would be so hurtful to me. And I think it's totally wrong and bullshit. But I want to be able to hear their side of the argument. Yeah, but that's, that is because it wouldn't, again, hurtful to you means you and I, Ina and Travis, I'm going to include you in this as well. We're scrappers, right? We're fine. I get a ton of internet hate and it doesn't bother me. You know, people send me horrible, horrible things. People told me they wished that my girl, my fiance got raped when I was on one show. I mean, I've gotten absolutely Yeah, people wish I get raped and my family gets bombed all the time. But we're scrappers, right? We're scrappers and we're, we're, we're okay with this. The answer I'm not okay with it. I'd rather people were nicer, but. Right. We'd rather, but we're stronger, right? Sticks and stones may break our bones, but words don't hurt us, right? In Mm. the same way. That is not a reason to allow something that could cause someone else real serious harm, right? We, We need to be aware that not everyone is okay after that kind of speech happens. And when we look at the suicide statistics among trans teens in the United States today and trans people in general, we know that, oh, okay, Words actually do hurt. And more importantly, people like Milo empower 
the people who otherwise and hurt physically and emotionally those people. When Milo says they should not be accommodated, he goes, he empowers those who want them to be otherized. And Okay, those- here's the thing, though. I, I, I even agree with you, but what's stopping people from using that argument against me or Mariam Namazi speaking on a university campus saying that it's- we deny Muslims their personhood because we criticize such a big part of their identity? Yeah, people can't. You criticize just- ideas, I know. and they are criticizing, he's criticizing people. That's it's a one sentence. Yes. Well, I, think, I think he's criticizing. He's criticizing the. I mean, obviously, he's criticizing the idea that trans people should be accommodated. But I think to to get into the larger thing of what you're talking about, um, and you're talking about sticks and stones, you know, don't break bones and words don't hurt. I think you know. Uh, there's been a, a real lack of education with our young people to instruct them in that dictum uh, that words don't necessarily need to hurt and that everyone is individually responsible for their own feelings. And that's and I, because I... And I think, ahead, that, I think that I think that I think that that you know uh, you know banning Milo only serves to further this notion that we've developed as a society that somehow if you have your feelings hurt, um, you know you don't you don't shore up your own emotional defenses and you don't you know kind of search yourself and 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 go through this process. What you do is you externalize that and you go to some higher authority and just point the finger and say that person hurt my feelings. And I'm not exactly sure that that culture is, and that, that notion is uh, good for the ideal, not the First Amendment, but the ideal of freedom of speech. Because you, if you're going to have freedom of speech, you're going to have hurt feelings. And if you're going to have hurt feelings, you need to teach the children, the 19-year-old babies, how to not get their feelings quite so hurt by ideas that they find distasteful. Well, well because so- it gets out of hand sometimes, right? I mean, well- people say that uh, saying there are some trans activists I've heard that claim that saying the word motherhood is transphobic, right? And that becomes then unfair. Or like there was an actress who ha- held a women's reproductive, uh, I don't know, some some event, and it was called like the Night of the Thousand Vaginas, and trans activists attacked her for ages because um, they said the word vagina was triggering. However, it. <laughs> If you have a vagina, you're the only person that's going to go to that thing if you need abortion or that kind of reproductive health care. You know, like whether you're a trans guy, this is not, they're not saying that people who, only people who have vaginas are women. It wasn't like that. It's just the night is of a thousand vaginas. So if trans men are triggered by the word vaginas, is it really transphobic to have that? If it, like... Do you understand what I'm saying? This gets out of hand. So we uh, have. I mean, the the political correctness run. I mean, that that's a whole other subject. Without without doing it the service it deserves, we don't define movements or argue against their points by, by the, the silliest by I the understand. or the silliest thing they've said. So, uh, you know, let's. I, I actually have things to say about that particular example, but my go-to example, which anyone who listens to me regularly will say. That's a scientist who wore the sexy shirt and the yes. feminist came after him. And he came on and he, he, wasn't, he wasn't NASA. He was EU space program. Sorry. People have tweeted me like a million times about that. And I apologize. <laughs> and he came on and he wept and he was super duper sorry. And I just thought that was silliness to the max. Well, I it was could horrible to make him cry. You have it is to not a refutation at- to any of the ideas of feminism or political correctness or social justice. It is just an example. And we don't accept that in intellectual dialogue, right? We don't we don't talk about fringes. Just like I wouldn't say, oh, well, you know, Travis, the Nazis agree with you. He'd be like, gross, Eli, why are you doing that? That's a gross thing to say. Right, <laughs> exactly, Godwin's Law. All right, and so in the same token, you know, while I understand the emotional place your argument comes from, it has no bearing on the idea. No, but do you see why it comes from that place is because people argue against ex-Muslims oh, routinely I, and sure, try absolutely. to stop us from speaking yeah, at and places. Those kids, those kids who interrupted Miriam Namazi are a perfect example of why proper ideology is important, right? Why did those kids not understand that Miriam Namazi wasn't violating a safe space? Well, because we don't talk about safe spaces in the right way. We have two oh, yeah, groups of I hate people the term. Talk- well, I mean, it's, it's an important 
mental health term and I've overseen safe spaces and I talk about safe spaces a ton and whenever people learn the proper definition of safe spaces, they stop abusing it. And what you see right now is you see neocons who go, oh, does the baby want their safe space? Well, what's funny see- is that the people you're talking about want their own safe spaces and they, they're very quick to block the people that they mock for blocking people and wanting. Right. It's very but, much mirror images. Right. But, but safe spaces have a have a real definition. Right? I which, understand. Which the behavior of the those students at Goldsmiths in every possible way counteracts. So we can look at a definition as, as grown-ups and go, no kids, you were wrong and here is why. And, and what happens is instead of us having the courage to turn to this younger generation and educate, instead we complain about them. And the, the suspicion I have about the reason why most people, and I'm not going to name names because I've asked them to have a conversation with me and they've said no, but the reason why most people would rather mock the younger generation and create straw men of them than have a conversation about the terms they attack is because they're wrong and largely they know it. It's simply a new political currency to talk about the rabid regressive left than it is to talk about the mental health resource that is a safe space. No one who learns that term wants to attack it. Nobody. But we use the term because it's a buzzword, right? Safe space. Well, the right? way I see it being used, I don't, I don't like it. But I understand and take your point that it has a different meaning. But you know, the and, jazz and hands and all of that. I think, I think, if I may jump in real quick, I think Eli, if, if I think if mental health professionals were the only ones using that terminology within the context of their profession, and that would be one thing. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, is I think you have. Uh, students using that term to describe all manner of, uh, you know, just, right, you know, room, rooms with Play Doh and puppies. Right, but we they, just clarified that a misuse of a term is not what we argue against. Right? No, no, but yeah, but the problem, I, I, I completely understand that, but the problem is, is, is it's become so, it's become so popular in the usage mm-hmm. that, that it is no longer a misuse of that term. It is simply, well, it's become that, popular. That, it's become popular and in that the term media. Now describes the, that term now describes the notion of a place where you go to avoid ideas that you don't like. Right. Well, that's that's what the media has sold us, but that's not actually what happens. So there are hundreds of space, safe spaces all around the country that are being used in a professional context, and they're used that way 365 days a year. You know, you can come into the LGBTQ Center at NYU in New York, where I live, and day in, day out, you can watch it be used correctly. But we see a news story about kids at Yale. And we see a news story at Goldsmiths, and all of a sudden, the term has lost its meaning. No, we do, again, we already admitted we don't use the fringe to fight against but or it, define I a term. I don't see it as a fringe if that's what I'm seeing uh, right. it used right. as. So yeah, it's, it's like it's not a fringe. It's not a fringe if everyone's using it that way. And I, I kind of feel like maybe it would be in the uh, mental health professionals' best interest to maybe come out. And and sort of clarify what this term means. So, so which I've never seen. I've never seen. I've never seen like a mental health professional come out and be like, all of these students, all of these you know left leftist students are using this term incorrectly. Here's what it actually means. Well, l- largely that is because the pieces you see about safe spaces are attacking the students, and they don't have time to differentiate between the two. They like they just can't be bothered. It's not good news. Um, but I, I just want to push back slightly because this this is actually pretty important, right? The fact that we in our consciousness are not aware of a safe space being used 300 days a year or its proper use, and then we see the three or four news articles in a year, or even 10 or 20 news articles in a year of it being misused, doesn't mean that the space has lost its meaning or that the term has lost its meaning. And we also need to under- we need to take on with that that the people who use that, for instance, uh, Project Greenlight or Greenlight safe spaces, which are for soldiers with PTSD who use those safe spaces, are served men and women who are back from their service and actually need those spaces. When they see an article from their favorite, you know, think piece author attacking safe spaces, they do not know, oh, he means this thing that the word doesn't mean. And mm-hmm. just as I am not responsible, or sorry, I'll use someone else because I've always used another person's name and everyone goes, what's wrong with him? So just as, uh, 
No Illusions, who's my co-host on the show, is not responsible for all the stupid stuff that I've said because I'm an atheist, right? Just as everyone doesn't bear, every atheist doesn't bear responsibility for the fact that I'm stupid and I can't do sit-ups and I look like two marshmallows stacked on top of each other, right? We all agree Noah is not responsible for that. We need to start having a conversation with the ideas. If people want to talk about the clinical idea of a safe space or the history of feminism, and they want to talk about why those are bad ideas, I'll talk about it every day, all day. But if they want to talk about the fringes of a movement, we will simply be caught up in minutia and never discuss the ideas and philosophies that are behind, right? And, and, and that's... And that's really problematic. It, it ends up meaning that we never actually have a conversation with the ideas that we're talking about. You know, and, well, and the, mm-hmm. while I am totally against misusing a safe space, I came out very firmly and I talk about it all the time. I'm firmly against misusing the term safe space to stop ex-Muslims from talking about the way they need to. But that is our job as educators not to go look at what safe spaces are, but to go look at how these children are misusing this terminology. Look at how they are misusing... Well, yeah, somebody needs to start talking about that, right? right? And, and it's well, not and, really right, happening. Right. Well, not, not, to, not, to circle it, not to circle it back around to Milo Yiannopoulos. Uh, well, know, we too, should. Yeah, I mean, maybe, okay, let, let me do it then. So, uh, you know, when we're... So, when Eli's talking about, you know, need, the need to address the misuse of a term like safe space. I think Milo Yiannopoulos, you know, I was talking about sunlight being the best disinfectant. I mean, that's a perfect opportunity when he misuses the term safe space. Um, It's a perfect opportunity to come in and then clarify what that means from a clinical perspective. So you have this sort of court jester uh, who is going to, who is going to misuse the term and he's going to misrepresent ideas. And that's your opportunity to step in and to clarify those ideas. But by kicking him off, you know, then you just sort of allow the people who keep Keep misusing the term safe space, even if they, you know, their heart's in the right place and they're 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 trying to use it, you know, correctly, but they they're not mental health professionals and they're just completely making buffoons of themselves, which is what which is what's happening largely. Um, then that just sort of keeps going on with, you know, right. no the problem no though is that side. you it is way easier to make a mess than it is to clean it up. And Milo's actually a great example. And I'll give you a great example for me, right? I have probably heard from, at this point, two dozen people telling me that transsexuality is listed in the DSM-4. And they say that because Milo tells them. Now, that's not true. Um, Gender dysmorphia is listed in the DSM-4, and it's actually only listed in the DSM-4 so that trans people can get the care they need. And there's actually a part in the DSM-4 where they say, transsexuality is not a mental illness. This is the feeling of being trans, and this is the justification for getting people the operations they need, the hormones they need, so that they can be their true selves. Now, I have clarified that, and... It's the, it's the, I'm sorry, just to point of clarity, it's the, it's the <laughs> distress. It's the distress. Exactly, yeah. It's the at, distress at, of at being the trans. At the exactly. Trans. exactly. And now, I have pointed that out Uh, a dozen times on various different shows. And I still get people who tweet at me and go, you know, Milo says that it's in the DSM-4. And I say, did you learn that from Milo? And they go, well, yeah. And then I go, no. And then I have to explain it over and over again. And that's the problem with this idea of sunlight killing bad ideas. If sunlight killed bad ideas, we would have never heard from Donald Trump again. All Mexicans are rapists and we need to ban Muslims temporarily until we figure this thing out. Technically, we, he didn't say all Mexicans are rapists. Oh, that's he right. said they're, they're sending us our, our, you know their rapists. I, I apologize to Donald Trump. I have a meeting <laughs> with him later this week and I'll make sure to do it in person. But, you know, if sunlight killed bad ideas... Well, no, I only stress because... We wouldn't live in the country we do. We live in a country of bathroom bills. We live in a country where at the RNC, a preacher comes out... But it's out, important and a to get response. our criticism accurate, right? Because otherwise I feel that criticism that oh, absolutely. Sorry, no, you, no, you're totally right to fact check me on that because someone else is going to if you don't. But, but the, the point being, if sunlight killed bad ideas, Donald Trump would be in a dunk booth full of semen somewhere, right? We'd just be like, oh, great. Here, go on, trans kid, throw an apple. You know, there, there's no way that we can live in the country we look in and intellectually, honestly say to ourselves, sunlight kills bad ideas. Because if it did, All the bad ideas, especially Trump's, who has gotten more media attention than any other candidate by far, who has had all of his lies fact-checked, who has had all of his bullshit called out, he would be gone. He would be laughed at. And the reason why he isn't is because sunshine does not kill bad ideas. It It may take time, though, right? Like, sometimes it takes 
people some time to see what the effect of that bad idea is. So we don't know in the future, Trump, uh, whether he's elected or not, just seeing the effect he's had uh, may shake people up and but terrify then, them and kill that bad idea. Who but knows? But however long it takes, however no, long it no, takes. No, but now, now this, is the, this is the distinction, right? Um, bad ideas, I think, this is a slippery slope, right? We cannot just ban bad ideas. Like I said, I would be interested in hearing a racist ideas just because I want to expand my mind. Like, not, but it, I, I want to clarify, I am not talking about banning ideas. I'm talking about educating to bad ideas, right? It's important that I learned Christian apologetics, right? Mm-hmm. It's important that I know Absolutely. what William Lane Craig's answers to a thing are. And then the, people the, also call for banning like a specific religion, right? Ban Islam. I think this is the stupidest right. solution re- that anyone could have to Islamism. Right. But the response to that is not ban the idea. The response is to educate people in the proper way. Since we have already agreed, I mean, I don't know if we've agreed, so jump in and correct me if we haven't. Since we've agreed, sunlight doesn't kill bad ideas, with Donald Trump as our example. I Since think sunlight, it depends on the time frame, right? It could. Sometimes yeah, it doesn't let kill. Me, that. I just want to. Well, I just want to be clear. I mean, when, when we talk about, you know, if, if we're if we're going down this road of this analogy, the sunlight doesn't kill. The sunlight doesn't disinfect immediately. It's not like Lysol. I mean, you do have to leave it out there for a while and let the sunlight do its work. Well, I think largely in the West we've combated racism, right? It's really and homophobia. It's right, we, kind of uh, socially unacceptable to be racist and homophobic. Right, and it we've took done a that long through, time. through social. We've done that through social pressures and social banning. Right, yes. people didn't stop being homophobic because there were a series of debates, and then we all turned and went, "Well, you know what? It looks like that homophobe is wrong." All right, I'm not homophobic anymore. No, but there have been a series of debates throughout right, but, history, but and that's not what formats. changed us. What changed and us it was, was also, social pressures. It was also sunlight, though. You know, it, the sunlight being, um, you know, first you had the birdcage come out, and then you had Will and Grace, and slowly. But surely, uh, the sunlight, where the American public got to know and understand gay people from a cultural and personal perspective, uh, changed their opinions and their views. And it happened gradually and glacially, but it did happen. And that's what the the sunlight I'm talking about is just the exposure. They were constantly exposed to this idea over time and over time their ideas changed opposite of what you're saying. That's sunlight exposure of good ideas, not sunlight killing bad ideas. Right? But we the, didn't have the four homophobia TV has phobia. been out there homophobia. as well. It's been out there on Fox News, it's been out there through Christian evangelists, it's been out there and then slowly slowly people have started to realize that Right, but the argument Travis just made is is actually the truth, that it, it wasn't the Christian evangelists and the homophobes on Fox News that taught us homophobia is wrong. It was Will and Grace. It was gay characters in TV and media. It was the birdcage. It is the exposure to good ideas and bad ideas through that lens. Now, I will say, Birdcage is my favorite movie in the world. It, it is <laughs> not making that up. It's my favorite movie. I watch it once a year on my birthday. It's my favorite movie in the world. I think it's some of the best comedy out there. Yeah, I love that it. Said, okay, I'm glad I could take you to a happy place. Yeah, yeah, genuinely, genuinely. That said, the exposure of homophobia through that piece is so brilliant because we see it through the eyes of allyship. Now, it's not a homophobic movie. I just watched a movie for no, my show. No, but then God you off. can't just have like allyship being thrown at you all the time. Then you have an echo chamber. When well, I watch Will Fox Grace. News, I'm strengthened in my positions. I'm a critic of Islam, but I am so different from that Fox News narrative. Do you understand what I mean? Right, but that's because you received the education in the proper way. If you adju- if you are an American kid in the South right now, you're you're well educated. You're aware of how to refute those ideas. If well, you're also a kid because in of the lived American experience. South, if you're a kid in the American South who doesn't have exposure to those good ideas and you just see Fox News, you don't cure Islamophobia by watching oh Fox Oh my gosh, Oops. I hate that word. Why you use that word? It's, uh, it's <laughs> hatred of Muslims? Right, Muslim phobia, well, anti Muslim bigotry. Anti Muslim bigotry. I can use yeah. that word instead. Please it's never it. use Islamophobia. Do ex Muslims a favor because we're constantly being accused. Uh, 
of attacking people when we're attacking ideas. And then when you use a word like Islamophobia, which conflates the two automatically, um, it's just unhelpful to the discourse. Oh, I've never heard that before. Uh, it, it, so let me say this, and perhaps this is a, a better way to put it. Uh, watching Fox News as a kid in the American South without access to resources to refute those ideas does not help my anti-Muslim bigotry, it enforces it, mm -hmm. which again refers to the idea of A, sunlight does not in fact kill bad ideas, it strengthens them, and sunlight on good Depends ideas- Depends on who you're talking but, about, right? Okay. There's many Muslims that have been hardcore Islamists and they've come out of it like, you know, but not by liberals. Be, again, not by being exposed to bad ideas. You keep, you keep referencing being exposed to good ideas. I'm talking about sunlight killing No, but bad sometimes ideas. it is that bad idea that is constantly screwing you over in life that you start to engage in critically thinking about whether this is helpful that's or not. because you engage in the critical thinking. But it is you, the you bad idea. You need that idea. second step. You, the bad idea may look, might make you inquire further until you find a good idea, but the bad idea in the first place simply reinforces bad ideas. So like what do we do with bad ideas then? We, we educate people about them. The way we educate people about creationism and Ike's ability of lizard theory, right? I absolutely, have no absolutely. What do you right. think, Travis? Well, I, I think that I think that you can't just you, you, you know when you, when we're talking about sunlight killing bad ideas, what we're talking about is we're talking about taking the bad idea and unpacking it and really examining it. Like with creationism, if you just say, "Oh, creation creationism is bad," it's just bad. Trust me, that that's not really that, that that's not helpful yeah. because then the, because then the person doesn't understand why it's bad. I totally agree. When I say sunlight kills bad ideas, what I'm saying is is what the you know you need to take the idea that you consider bad and unpack it and expose it to and expose it to the sunlight. And 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 and, when, and also when we talk about sunlight killing bad ideas, the sunlight is the good idea. So you have this you, you know you have this duality of, of ideas and without that duality um, you know you're not you're not really making any particular moral choice. And without moral choice all you have is an echo chamber. The the, the Sunlight is attention, as as I understand that phrase to be used, right? And what you're talking about when you talk about putting attention on bad ideas and unpacking it is actually about putting attention on good. That's what I'm advocating. Again, I'm not talking about no one ever hears creationism again. What I'm talking about is creationism being taught the way my science teacher taught it to me, which was to show us the Family Guy clip that had I Dream of Genie and go, any questions? I mean, Miss <laughs> Bostrom, best science teacher I ever had, and that was literally, she was like, they say I should teach you something about creationism. Here, dan -dan -dan -dan. she was like, any questions? And we were all like, Miss Bostrom, why'd you do that? And she was like, good, we're learning about fossils. And that's there is now. That's a joke. Obviously, I'm making a joke there. But, but if, the if a science teacher wanted to take someone to the uh, the Noah's Ark creation museum or whatever and the fuck. explain to them why it's wrong they are exposing them to good ideas and bad ideas yeah but they're only exposing bad ideas in the context of good ideas through the lens yes. of good That's ideas what I'm talking about that, yes. right, but milo's not exposed to people through okay. the lens of good ideas let's nor, make these distinctions clearer so there are some distinctions that we have now i think agreed upon there's a distinction between freedom of speech like as in the first amendment and freedom of speech as a concept and then there's there's a distinction between being banned for attacking ideas and there's a distinction between being banned from social media for attacking people and denying them personhood. Right. And when we talk about Milo being exposed to sunlight, Milo does not give annotated talks, right? Milo doesn't talk and then I pause him and then I go, all right, here's why what he just said is bullshit. He just says bullshit. And it is up to that audience to then expose themselves to good ideas, which obviously, based on the fans he has and the way they behave, they do not which means that his ideas need to be taught in the context of good ideas. Just as we agree, many, many, many other bad ideas. Right, but need to again, be now, the how do we bring this back to his Twitter ban? Right, we we went off on a tangent talking about his university talks, but anyways. Oh, I mean, my, my answer to the Twitter ban. Sorry, I, I I did distract us, and I apologize. And Travis, I've talked a little over you, so jump in and tell me to be quiet. Um, at any Don't time. let him talk. Yeah. As he said earlier. <laughs> kick me in the throat, Travis. Genuinely, I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a chatterbox. Oh, kick me in the throat. But no, I, please, I, no violence. Yeah, no, when it comes it, to the... 
Well, he's an MMA guy. He gets it. Um, <laughs> when it comes to the Twitter ban, I, I bring back to the example of the restaurant, right? We've all agreed that an unequal enforcement of the rules is not a defense of Milo. Now, if there's a defense of Milo that I'm not aware of for why he belongs on Twitter, why he did not violate that term of service, and why that independent business in the name of liberalism should not be allowed to deny him service. I'm totally open to it. I will admit I'm wrong here on the spot right now. Okay, well, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm in a very unfortunate position on this particular podcast because I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm cast in the role of defending um, Defending but, you know, who, let's, sorry? Let's, pretend, let's just pretend for the moment that I'm a public defender and I really don't have a choice of clients, okay? But you also <laughs> say you value his voice, right? So I'm not just forcing well, I value, you I value, I value, I value intellectual diversity, and he is you know, one of the, the most outspoken uh, critics of uh, a number of ideas that I think have monopolized the, the, intellect, the, the conversation as far as— Do you um, value Ken Ham also? Ken Ham, I, sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, of course. I, you I think do. Th- he's the, is he the Australian guy? Yes. Is he? Is he? He's the guy that does the Noah's Ark, right? Yeah, Creation Museum. Yeah, I love that guy. He's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I want to give amazing. Travis some but credit listen. here. I want to give Travis. I want to give you credit. I think what you're talking about is you're talking about the defense. Of, you know, you you want the you don't want Milo's ideas spread. You want the ability for those ideas to be spread. I, I want to give you the benefit of the. I mean, it all comes back to the. It, it all comes back to the. I'll defend the death. You're right to say it. Quote. But but, exactly. but I think it's a bit more than that. Well, and if, that's, I, if I may, I'm sorry. If I may, I'm mean, just really quickly. Please, please, please. Um, the just to kind of go off in a different direction. Um, you know, my the, the, there's another argument, Eli, that that I've heard that I haven't heard you say, which is simply that Milo didn't actually violate the terms of service. Oh, I mean, I according to the so I've read three articles on this, and this is what the information that I have: uh, Milo either created or was the first to distribute fake tweets uh, from Leslie Jones, which incited um, his fans, which he knows regularly do this kind of thing, to uh, do terribly abusive things. Now, to keep in mind, this is not. The first time Milo's done this. this is this is the last. This is the straw that broke the camel's back in a series of terrible things he's done. But of creating the fake tweets with the intent, creating the fake tweets, or at least being the first to distribute well, them. Well, he don't, knowingly we don't know he, distributed them. That much them, is right, not. He knowingly distributed them. Uh, we well, don't know if he created them. He just um, retweeted it, but but okay, throat kick, throat kick. Um, <laughs> Please so, go ahead. So, uh, Which is so, against the terms of service. What would you What would you then say? Uh, well, first of all, he didn't incite anyone. I mean, he didn't explicitly say like, "Hey, everyone, go no, say me things to Leslie Jones." So, so two things. Two things I'd like to hear uh, Eli's uh, perspective on. Two things. One is. Uh, that Leslie Jones on on the day in question was repeatedly tweeting incredibly hostile things to other people, like White and, Becky, the white supremacist, right? And and you know, but you know, she she literally tweeted out to her followers, "Get her," right? But I don't know the context of what she said, what White Becky had said to her. That's the screenshot that when most people haven't seen, like what was said. I don't know. And then, so, so saying get her, okay, is, is bad. I'm not no. denying that. So, I mean, so, but, but what I'm, let saying, me just what I'm finish. saying is Leslie Jones did, Leslie Jones did incite her she followers. She did, but to she did it in retaliation to people attacking her, which is very different from just going to someone and attacking them and spreading fake tweets about them. Well, that Leslie could harm Jones, their career. And okay. I want to talk about retaliation. Leslie Jones did tweet out. And again, I'm, Public defender here, but Leslie Jones did tweet out to did did retweet tweets about Milo calling him uh, a gay Uncle Tom. Yeah, she did. I, but you see what what did Milo what did My, Milo did something that could damage her career, right? And in this argument, what is yeah. interesting to me is that you are more interested in defending Milo than someone that was a victim of a r- vicious racist attack by a bunch of people, including well, Milo not explicitly, but he potentially could cause her harm in her career, right? By sharing those screenshots. And for me, that is enough to think that maybe it's okay to ban him after he's been given warnings, after his had his account suspended before, and he's been told not to engage in this kind of behavior. And he himself said, I've been preparing for this. So he knows he does this. 
Uh, so, I mean, for me, I'm not inclined to like say, but, but, but ISIS, you know, why are they still, why not Milo? Why ISIS? What? Yeah. Okay. Twitter isn't evenly applying those rules, but I want to also make the distinction as someone who constantly gets banned on social media, whose podcast is banned for no fucking reason between people who are challenging ideas that make un- people uncomfortable and people who viciously attack other people and people who have a, a pattern of doing this. Do you understand that difference? Uh, do I understand the difference between what you do and what Milo does? Yes. I mean, I guess I would say that f- from, a, from a freedom of speech standpoint, I really don't. Uh, I mean, you're, you're no, being... No, but attacking people, targeting them... And spreading false tweets about them, you don't think that that's different from saying, oh, well, this, the concept of this religion and this blah, 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 this should be challenged because it causes harm to people and causes people to be oppressed. You don't see the difference between attacking people and attacking ideas? Um, well, I, I think obviously, you know, there obviously there's a difference between attacking people and attacking ideas, but here's the thing. When you attack Islam, I can completely see how someone might misconstrue that or intentionally construe that as you being attacking them. Why, though? But they're wrong. Do you see how they're wrong? <laughs> they're wrong. And, 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 and I, my- no, I, I don't mean to say it like I'm a douche and I'm, I'm right and they're wrong. No, but attacking people and attacking ideas, this is a distinction that isn't clear to many people. This is why terms like Islamophobia are such a big problem. Because Islam is conflated with Muslims time and time again. And the way liberals like John Oliver, John Stewart, Samantha Bee are free to attack Christianity and laugh at it and still be called liberal, I want ex-Muslims to have that freedom. We are stuck in a very weird position because we're not accepted by the mainstream left. And we would be welcomed by the right, but for the wrong reasons, because they want to, like, especially the far right wants to, like, use ex-Muslim narrative to demonize Muslims. So we're stuck in this position of having very little allyship. I, 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 hear, I hear what you're saying, but I, I think what I'm trying to highlight here is how subjective the space that you're entering is. No, and I I understand that. This is why I want to drive home that distinction of people criticizing ideas and people people attacking people. And this isn't the first time Milo's done this, right? He said a lot of things that target specific people. And yes, this is not just about quote tweeting people, because if if we're going to start banning people for quote tweeting people, then everybody should be banned, right? So this is why I feel like I'm on the fence, but I lean more towards the yeah, because they got him on a technicality. They did if he violated terms of service. Well, he he was he, the terms of service specifically that he was banned for was for people to say mean things to Leslie Jones. But people were saying mean things to Leslie Jones for hours and hours and hours before Milo ever got involved. So I I, I don't know. I, I you know. So why on, this need to defend strictly, this man? Tack, on a strictly on a strictly ticky tack kind of um, you know by the. You know, just sort of the rule of law. I, I, I don't think that Twitter uh, necessarily appropriately applied uh, their terms they of didn't. service. They didn't. No, they didn't. But, um, but that's but a even if, point. So because of that, what you know, what what we're left with is this thing that really smacks of an ideological uh, um, sort of a t- attack on on Milo just for no, being, because then he would have been banned for a long time ago. He would have uh, been banned for his, so many. Did, he did get his he did get his little what blue, blue check mark thingy taken he away. He did, but. yeah. Oh come on, he survived without it just fine. This is not yeah. really you know persecuting him. He's not a victim. This is what I hate about his ban. He's not really the martyr that everyone's making him out to be. And let me just read you a little paragraph, and I'd love to have your take on this. Okay, this is from an article. So perhaps what's what's needed now is bolder form of censure after all, because the internet is not a universal human right. If people cannot be trusted to treat one another with respect, dignity, and consideration, perhaps they deserve to have their online freedoms curtailed. For sure, the best we could ever hope for is a smattering of unpopular show trials. But if the internet, ubiquitous as it now is, proves too dangerous in the hands of the psychologically fragile, perhaps access to it ought to be restricted. We 
ban drunks from driving because they're a danger to others, isn't it time we did the same to trolls? What do you think? Mm, well, that sounds like something uh, Milo Yiannopoulos might have once said. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, I mean, how can you argue against that? He made his own case for his own ban. Uh, uh, sure, sure. I mean, you know, I, I, that's fine. And again, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't want to be put in a position of, you know, defending any specific or anything that Milo says because he, he's Milo's Milo and, and I'm me. Um, you know, and 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 he, you know, uh, yeah, he, he said that and 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 he made the case for his own banning. But uh, that to me, I'm not as interested in that. I'm, I'm interested. Look, I'm a, I'm a free speech fundamentalist, right? And, and I think that more free speech is always better. Better, as I've kind of, I think I've been pretty consistent about that on this podcast so far. You know, I think more sunlight is better than less. I think that um, you know, the more people you have uh, expressing ideas and, and being clear. Now, now, I think you mentioned in our in a in a brief Twitter exchange that we had, uh, Ina, about what about block buttons and, and blocking mm-hmm. people and stuff like that. And and look, if someone is going to be disrespectful and rude, you block them. Leslie Jones should have blocked Milo. But freedom. Speech. Hmm? Freedom of speech, cornerstone uh, of liberalism. Wouldn't she well, be taking- freedom of speech? Right, but freedom of speech doesn't mean doesn't necessarily mean that the people have to necessarily that individuals have to listen to it. Right. What do you think, um, Eli? Have we lost you? Oh no, no. I was listening. I honestly, I was just trying not to interrupt. And, and Travis, I think you bring up a really interesting point, and, and I want to clarify for a couple of reasons. The first is I have a, I mean, not as large as you do, but I, I have a pretty um, large listenership, and I want to clarify what I have gotten from you is not a defense of Milo, but rather a defense of Milo's ability to say the things he says. Is that is that fair? Just because yeah. I, I feel like I want to clarify to people listening that I, I think what concerns you about this situation so much Milo what Milo said or whether or not what Milo said was okay to say but whether or not by shutting Milo down we create an environment where it becomes not okay to say the less popular thing and whether or not Twitter showed its bias now I know I think you answered that Super well by showing that if if Twitter had shown its right or left leaning bias, he would have been banned for calling Trump daddy months ago, right? Uh, and I think that's really interesting. But I did just want to clarify that w- what I've gotten from banned you is for calling Trump dad. No, no, but he does say a lot of anti left stuff. I don't think calling Trump daddy is one of those. Oh things, no, I was just using okay. that as an example. Okay, just, yeah, just as an example. Um, but I, but I I think the the point you bring up that's really interesting when it comes to to blocking and stuff like that is is not necessarily because that's about how people should react to the speech that that we're talking about uh, and and it's a good one it is a good one and I, I don't I don't want to think that uh, I don't want you to think that I'm dodging it but the question that is about what should be the consequences of person making the speech right because then we've we've taken the consequences and we've put them on Leslie right it was Leslie's job to block Milo and the hundreds if not thousands of people that sent her abuse and disgusting pictures of herself covered in cum and compared her to Harambe the gorilla right it was now we're putting the response on her to deal with that speech rather than the person who caused it. So, so my answer would be, I bring that back to the person causing the problem, not the person who's the victim of it. Mm-hmm. Travis? Uh, you know, yeah, I, I guess I guess there's something in me that just kind of recoils at the thought of thinking about of, of calling someone who is having things said about them of a victim. Um, you know, I, I agree that the you know obviously what happened, you know, the the tweeting to you don't Leslie think Jones, she was a victim of racist harassment that day? Of course I do. Of course, well, I, I, victim. I mean, people were. I think other people were being. You know, racist and and terrible. But you also have to understand that she, she, she was trolling the trolls. I mean, she was out there responding to people and calling people bitch and white bitch. Yes, yes. And that, I mean, that's wrong. Using incredibly and, it, and, and using incredibly inflammatory language and calling Milo a you see what I'm Milo saying? Gay You're... Uncle Tom and all this stuff. And it's like, well, you know, if here Internet Rule 101 is if if you want Internet hate, the best thing to do is go out there and just start calling people names and, and trying to kick up dust. Yeah, and but she didn't up. go to Milo's account and just start this randomly, right? 
He's the uh, one that told her that, oh, please stop, like, making a big deal out of it. Everyone gets trolls. When it was really vile. He came to her is what I'm saying. So, but you're still inclined to defend him, the defender of the racist tweets and the downplayer of the racist tweets. But calling her a victim, you recoil at that. Well, I kind of I have a, it's when, I mean, look, if she was just going about her merry way. And then all of a sudden, here comes all of this hate for no, because like, you know, like, like there was like some 4chan board that was like, let's get Leslie June, she sucks. And they went after her. Well, then, yeah, that's that's pretty terrible. But from what I've seen, she, you know, she got some some people were like, Ugh, your movie's terrible. And she's like, fuck you. And, you know, she just kind of let them have it. And uh, so here's my question. If if Leslie Jones had not. Uh, I don't want to say deserved because I know you don't mean deserved, but if, if Leslie Jones had not reacted the way she had, if she had just been assaulted by this racism, if he had just shown, and he's done that to people before, it's not hard to imagine Milo doing this. I mean, he tweeted that picture of the heavy set person at the gym and said fat should be shamed wherever it is, you know, various ex- examples of him just attacking at someone. If that had happened, would you support the ban or is it her reaction to the hate that you think means he shouldn't have been banned? I- I'm curious. Well, yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I don't think, I mean, hmm, the, you, you just said a lot of stuff and I'm parsing it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think... If she hadn't responded, would he be I right think, in being banned? If, yeah, look, I think I think if you know, there had been all this stuff and she just kind of came out and was like, what in the world? What are you guys doing? And uh, Jack, uh, what's his nuts from you know Twitter, hit her up and was like, oh, man, I'm seeing all this ter- terrible stuff. Hey, you need to DM me. And, 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 they, and they worked it out and they figured this stuff out. And yeah, I, I think you're looking, I mean, I would, I would feel slightly different about it. But, you know, I, the fact remains that, you know, I, I think that there was a lot of accounts that, you know, should have been banned before Milo's got there. Yes, banned. but do you think that maybe Jack dislikes Milo because he ruins his pla- – he misuses his platform and causes well, think, it to have a very exactly, toxic, hateful exactly, environment? And, think, and it's not really yeah. then a liberal bias or some conspiracy against silencing poor conservative voices. It's just you are misusing my product. And you have been warned several times. So maybe that got his attention. Yes, they should equally ban everyone that violates. But but if the Ayatollah got banned, or if an ISIS account got banned on a technicality, would you be fighting for them? Would there be a hashtag for them? On a technicality? If it was a technicality and they... They're just they, vile they people, actually though. spreading hate, but if the I, I, they I totally get on there, hate. it's like... And spreading hate is not... A, it's, it's so subjective, right? So subjective. It's so subjective. subjective. So that's what um, I'm saying. What's not when subjective. you get someone that is vile, that you think that... Well, many people think is vile. You don't think he's vile. You think he's valuable. And this is the key difference. I think saying... I think saying... I think, <laughs> I think saying something snarky to somebody is... Uh, world apart from sending someone a Photoshop picture of them covered in jizz. Yeah, of course. Yes, you know? it is. So I, th- I think whoever sent that, whoever but sent they that were probably stuff, banned because the gorilla pictures. Those those accounts need to be closed. Um, but do you do you agree that Milo knowingly because he's done this before and he knows what people do right he knows what his fans do and he applauds it in its own way right he he winks at it and he he allows it and he certainly encourages it he downplays uh, and, and any it, hor- horrible right, behavior he downplays it and he do you think that he is responsible for that right he six masses of people on people and, and just as a counterexample and not to toot my own horn but like. I, I have a fairly decent following because of my shows, and whenever I'm engaged in a conversation, I did a four-hour debate on social justice, and I spent the first five minutes going, don't send James mean tweets. Do not send James mean tweets. Similarly here, anyone who is on quote-unquote my side of this who sends Travis a mean tweet, you're not on my side, and I'm completely against everything you do. If I see it, if I'm tagged in it, I'm going to call it up. Now, that's my policy. Absolutely. My- Same like uh, – Sam Harris, uh, he did say, you know, uh, be Milo. respectful to Mariam Namazi when they had their big debate or discussion. Right. And I had a guy, a uh, Canadian journalist on my show about Charlie Hebdo, and he got so much harassment. I felt awful, like sexual harassment, like 
people were tweeting vile things at him. I am on the complete opposite end of everything that we discussed with him. We have completely differing opinions, and we debated, and we had a good debate, and we didn't agree, and he was like, oh, atheist like you, blah, 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 even though he's an atheist too. But the right. thing and is, I had, to, I had to tweet and people and tell them to stop harassing him. I did not say, oh, please, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting a few trolls. Everyone gets them and encourage his harassment, even though I disagree with him. Do you understand? Like that, that is how responsible people should behave and discourage attacks on other people. But and by this, not doing it, you are tacitly approving of it because you're aware of what the internet is. But we is can't here. ban this. This right. is we can't ban because it's so intangible, it's so vague, we cannot ban that feeling of being responsible of not being responsible and encouraging people, uh, especially if he didn't explicitly do so. What I'm saying is that what tips it over is his violation of terms of service. And if Anjum Chaudhry or uh, Reza Aslan, people I think that are doing harm to the conversation, if they were if they were banned for doing something wrong, for violating Twitter terms of service, I certainly wouldn't jump on a hashtag for them. I certainly wouldn't do it for Milo. So what worries me about people who are um, saying that, oh, well, I'm not a fan of Milo, but based on the principle of freedom of speech, I'm going to support this thing. No, because I think you slightly have sympathies towards why else are you fighting so hard for Milo or Milo or whatever his name is? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not. Well, first of all, I'm not, I'm not fighting so hard. No, no. <laughs> No, 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 that wasn't directed specifically um, at you. I've uh, seen a lot and, of people, uh, though. You know, I, I, you know, obviously my concern, again, it, it all comes back to my concern being who's next. And and I think you said something interesting earlier. You said uh, that Jack, uh, you know, was, you know, is it, is, it, is, it that, is it that Milo, is it that Jack is a leftist and Milo is a conservative? And so, you know, he was looking for an excuse or is it that Milo actually was hurting his product? So it was a business decision. I think it was probably both. I think it was, um, you know, Milo, Milo is the poster child for what most people consider to be wrong with Twitter. And, um, you know, I think Jack was absolutely looking for some reason to get this uh, loud, boisterous uh, guy out of his bar. Again, such nice adjectives to describe someone like my little loud, boisterous, <laughs> you mean uh, destructive, toxic, vile, uh, yeah. misogynistic. But I think we agree that... that- Twitter is a better place. The restaurant is a nicer restaurant without Milo in it. And if his fans, as they've threatened to, leave it, Twitter will be a much, much better place without them. I guess the question that I would pose to Travis that I'm really interested in your opinions on is, you know, if Milo was actually against this abuse, and look, you know, this is the thing that I do to counter hate speech, especially because I'm a blue comedian. Like, I work super crazy blue, and I also work very critical. What do you of mean people. blue comedian? Oh, I'd say... uses com- bad words. I use bad words, I swear. Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah a, like, but the blue comedian? That sounds like something, like, my parents' generation would say. Is. <laughs> <laughs> I, it means, I, I swear, I swear a lot. I use very dirty comedy, and so I take those extra steps to make sure that the people who engage with me, like you, like James, like the other people who have engaged with me in conversation, are safe to do so. And I, and I mean this, I would genuinely not consider it safe to have a conversation with someone of my listenership if I did not take actions. And, and if you follow through my Twitter, you'll find me screaming at people being like, you're not on my side, don't you ever say that to someone. Or get out of here, don't ever say that, you're not on my side, and then apologizing to the person I've had a conversation with. I'm not saying it's the obligation of Milo to do that, but is it in your opinion partially him encouraging that abuse when he shrugs his shoulders and places that blame on Leslie? I, I don't know if Milo is necessarily was necessarily encouraging abuse, but I certainly think that he was setting the table for it. Okay, so that's something we can agree if on. That, if that makes any sense, do you, you think know, he deserves to be? Do you think he deserves to be banned for that? You know, I, th- I kind of want to bring up, um, you know, when we talk about inciting people, I, I do, I do want to bring up, uh, Ru- I, I, I'm just kind of, this, this might sound random at first, but I want to bring up Rwanda. You know, the violence, like the machete and limbs and hacking and the screaming and the running, it all, it all started with, uh, y- you know, radio personalities getting on the radio and saying, you know, this is what is going down. You, if you are a Hutu, you need to go find some Tutsis and you need to hack them up. 
right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, that is inciting people to do harm to other people. Um, and I think when we talk about Milo going, uh, <laughs> he tweeted that thing, and I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm laughing, but I'm sorry. If I'm, if I'm laughing, then it was funny. If I'm laughing, then it was funny. Um, you know, Milo is, is definitely on the record as, as repeatedly talking about how he enjoys having sex with black men. And, uh, so he then, re- then he can't be racist. No, that's not what I'm saying. No, okay. I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he retweeted oh, no, uh, weird some defense. pictures. He, he retweeted some picture of Leslie, uh, some uh, uh, something of Leslie Jones saying something bad about him. I think it was the the gay Uncle Tom tweet. Yeah. And and he goes, uh, uh, he goes, ugh, rejected by another black dude. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which is, which you know, I, that's to me, it's it's so that's what I'm saying by setting the table. Like, you know, he's got a lot of followers, mm-hmm. and so when people see that, they go, oh. Someone's beefing with with Milo. Well, I'm going to go fix their little wagon. And so Milo wasn't saying get her. Mm-hmm. He wasn't saying you know, hey, followers, go let him let her have it or whatever. He just he he tweeted something snarky at her, and his followers you know saw this and said, hey, you know, and we got into this whole in group out group modality, and and uh, you know that's the I think that's what happened. So I don't I don't know if he was inciting so much as he was just sort of putting it out there that this was a person that he didn't like and who had said bad things about him. Right. Was it a dick thing to say? Absolutely. But I think that kind of dick thing to say, you should be free to say it. Uh, There's so many people that say that kind of stuff, right? It's a horrible thing to say and it can hurt someone. I understand. But this is Twitter. People say that kind of shit all the time. We can't be banning people for saying something snarky, as he said. Uh, he didn't explicitly say anything racist. The one thing that they get him on is those screenshots that he shared. I think that's the only thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Otherwise, he could be banned so many times over if it was just about him, like, quote, tweeting someone. Um, and, and, as could, and who as, doesn't, as, right? As, as, yeah, I get trolls. Hundreds of thousands of, of yeah. Twitter. I get trolls, I mean, and if, if they say if, something particularly stupid, I love to expose them so that everyone can laugh at them. I'll retweet them. I'll share what they said. I, I mean, sure, I'm probably not being the nicest person to them, but they're also not being nice to me when they say, "Oh, we should bomb your family because you have a Muslim background." I'll retweet that because I'm like, "Hey, check out what an idiot this person is," or. But should I be banned for that? I don't think so. I think for me, what banning Milo ultimately did was it underscored what I consider to be the fact that if you're banning Twitter users for saying mean things to people, which ostensibly is why he was banned. He's just an asshole and he says mean things to people. If that's why you're banning people, then a huge portion of Twitter's user base should also be banned. Yes. And and when you realize that and when you when you sit there and you say well if that if that's bannable then you know, out you know what thirty, forty percent of Twitter's users should be banned, and then and then you start thinking, well, why am I even on Twitter in the first place? But that's not really just why he was banned, though. He's it's been a step by step thing. He's had warnings and the screenshots. So then, if you have no, a sure, but I, I know, I know. I'm saying like he's 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 exhibited this pattern of repeatedly saying mean things to people, but so have so many other Twitter users. Yeah, but I think we determined at the beginning that other people deserve to have the rules enforced on them is not a defense of mm-hmm. Milo. Exactly. That's like just because. Uh, oh no, no, I'm just, I'm just trying to highlight. I'm just trying to highlight. I'm just kind of trying to, to to get into a sort of a meta perspective of what the Milo ban ultimately means. I think to Twitter, which is, I think people are going to start waking up to the fact that. Uh, it is filled with a bunch of assholes, and they are going to have to wonder: Is this a space that I really want to be in? And I think That's that that internet. doesn't bode well for Twitter as a platform. Well, can I, can I ask a question? Is hmm. the banning of Milo a symbol for trying to make Twitter a better, safer place? I don't think so. Because if I were if I were at a restaurant. Where, or a bar, right? Like a dive bar where a bunch of dangerous characters hang around and one of the most famous was Stabby Jim. And then one night, the owner kicks Sammy and Jim, Stabby Jim out and Stabby Jim can never come back. That that's to me physical is physical violence, a, Stabby Jim. Um, but it's a metaphor. I think it's pretty easy to follow along. Um, 
it's I think to me that would be a message as a patron of that dive bar that this bar is trying to make it a safer place. Similarly, couldn't we say the banning of Milo is Twitter's way of saying we are making this a safer, better place? I think it would be uh, – the analogy – the only analogy that just kind of pops in my head is what if the NFL issued lifetime bans to its athletes for being arrested? Like you get arrested once, you're no longer playing football. What would the league look like? And I think, you know, that's kind of – that's kickers, kind of – Kickers, just kickers. It would no, just be, it would is, be all We're talking kickers. about arresting. We're talking about stabbing. These are completely different things to being banned from a me- social media platform. That- no, no, but what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that on, on Twitter, you know, if, if – uh, saying mean things to people is is bannable. Then, but it's I, not. Know. But it, that's not it. There's other thing. There's other but factors to it. What, but that's why he was. You just said that's why he was banned. He was banned because of this repeated sort of. Not for say no, no <laughs> for 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 the screenshot thing. I said that's what makes me think that his ban is acceptable. Well, but he wasn't banned for the screenshot. Whatever they said, who knows what incitement means to to them, right? Whatever their internal, it's so vague. Their internal right. decision is we're not privy to that, but no, they a- do have him on a technicality, and I'm not going to be the one fighting for him. Or that stupid, pathetic hashtag free Milo. Come on, he's not he's not unfree. That's so social justice warrior. That's so the reverse of what these people make fun of. You know, they want to make fun of left-leaning social justice warriors. They're the exact same thing. He's not imprisoned. He's free. He can speak elsewhere. He broke rules. He was thrown out. There's nothing to stomp your feet about, you know? He was told multiple times. Well, I think ultimately, for me, what the Milo ban represents is a... uh, is is Twitter failing to live up to the promise of its premise of freedom of speech? You but know, why? To, I mean, it has all kinds of platform. David it's Duke's to be this on there where people can, um, you know, exchange ideas, and it's a free exchange of ideas. The problem that happens is that a lot of those ideas aren't really all that nice. And no, but listen, the white genocide hashtag. I find it a very interesting one to visit from time to time, and I'll chuckle at their silly tweets. But if they're not attacking people, I mean, I think they're f- free to have that hashtag go in and tweet their hateful shit. But once they start, you know, cornering someone and, you know, spreading false lies about them, then Twitter may look at it if it's a high profile enough thing. Do you understand? That's a big distinction here. There's all kinds, there's all kinds of Nazis and white genociders and people who are celebrating yeah, cop killing those people I think also should be banned. Like people calling for violence. I wouldn't be upset if they were banned. Are I'm there- on Twitter. Pardon? Just as an example. I was adding to the examples. I, I missed yeah. it. I didn't hear it. Oh, I said I'm on Twitter. You're on you're on Twitter. <laughs> it was a it was a joke. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. No, but yeah, okay. Well, I, think, I think you're. I kind of think you're speaking to my to my point, Inya, about um, Ina. Excuse me, Ina, about um, you know the fact that there are so many bad actors on, and, and, I, and I mean, I mean that in the bad actor sense, not in like the bad they perform <laughs> poorly. But there's that so many. Too, though. That too. Yeah, I'm sure there are. There are also, unfortunately, a lot of bad actors. I might be one of them on Twitter. Um, but uh, you know, it, it just kind of it's, it's speaking to my point that there are so many of these these bad folks on Twitter, and I think what the Milo ban has done is it's thrown that into high high relief and people are having to examine whether or not Twitter is even a space they want to be in and uh, I'm, I'm not exactly, if, if I'm Jack, I'm not exactly sure that banning Milo was ultimately good for business. Well, actually a lot of people are now feeling better about being on Twitter too. It really depends on what perspective you look at yeah, it that's, from. That's right. Well, I think, it depends, I think it depends on what your ideological slant is. I think if you're on the left, you're like, great, Twitter's for me. And if you're on the right, you're like, wait a second. What what the hell? Sure, so, he got you know, but, I mean, he's, but he's, they he's got politi- him on something he's, legit. That's the point. Nah, it's not legit. He's politicized his platform and ultimately the screenshots and I think- are not legit. This, so this is the crux of what I've been trying to screenshots are not legit. They're not they're not a good reason to get rid of him. That's not saying mean things. That's spreading falsehoods. That's like, you know, impersonation as well, which is very broad. Um, well, I think it's, I, you know, I, the, the screenshot thing, 
I, I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> th- there's a reason we have a verification system on Twitter, right? There's a reason we have the blue check mark. Lindsey Jones has that blue check mark. The screenshots that he 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 sent out did not have the blue check. I know, mark. but people are not necessarily going to notice that. What? He okay, but if we're talking about technicalities, we're talking about technicalities. But your inclination is to always find the out for Milo. This is what I don't out. understand. Right. I, th- I think Jack did. I think Jack found the out. <laughs> no, an out from being held accountable, not an out from Twitter. Um, well, I think we circle back around to sunlight being the best disinfectant. I mean, if you if we're going to hold Milo accountable, quote unquote, hold Milo accountable, um, you know, maybe maybe a better conversation would have been to have shown why he was wrong. And but I think banning him, um, all that does ultimately is solidify the alt right's position that the left is, are have transmogrified in the last few years into uh, cultural authoritarians who are unwilling to brook any disagreement with their own ideology. Well, Travis, let me let me ask you a question on that. And a, first of all, uh, huge ups for the Calvin and Hobbes reference uh, that deserves credit. Uh, and second of all, yeah, <laughs> that's actually where I learned that word. <laughs> it's awesome, awesome. It's the only way that word exists for me. Uh, and the second thing, the question that I would ask you is, uh, and I, I don't know that you identify with alt right, but but since you sort of spoke to how they might feel about this. It, it's interesting to me that the alt right would identify with someone whose behavior is defined by abuse and vitriol and racism and misogyny and transphobia and and, and all, all that kind of stuff. For them to look to my if I were alt right, right, which I don't, I have lots of alt right buddies who definitely don't. Um, or libertarian buddies who definitely don't uh, ally themselves with Milo. If I were all right, I would think, oh, good, the worst version, this this straw man of my position that fights against the author- authoritarianism of the left, which you just spoke of, which I think all of us on this call agree has real consequences in the world today is a real problem. Wouldn't they be glad to see this person who gives their movement a bad name gone? I have no idea. I mean, I, I, politically, I'm sort of uh, I'm I'm to the left, and then I'm like a left uh, uh, libertarian, basically. Like like on the I don't know if you've ever taken that that political quiz where like you answer like a ton of questions and it puts you on this quadrant. How do you feel about face veils? I don't know what that was. face veil is. That a role playing game? <laughs> no, 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 like religious face veils, like face veils, veils on the face. Uh, I think if I think if you're doing it of you, I mean, you're kind of putting me on the spot, but if you're doing it of your own volition and you think it looks awesome and you're like, check out my face veil, I'm badass with my face veil, then go for it. If your husband or uh, the cops or the state is being like, hey, 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 you need to wear this face veil when you go outside. And I have a problem with that because I'm a liberal. That seems fair. But what about Please like check out me and Travis's new website, faceveils.com. We're face going veils. to do this um, together. <laughs> we're we're going to um, battle with nerf swords. What? What about in the airport or like courtrooms where nobody else gets to cover their face? Yeah, I have a problem with that. Okay, good. Just checking. But then that, you know, isn't it? Good, Travis. (laughs) Good, good you do. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. (laughs) No, seriously, I'm sick of liberals not having a problem with that. But um, since you said you were libertarian, sometimes. No, no, I'm not a libertarian. I'm I'm in the, like, so there's the, there's the left, right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And then there's the then there's the authority then the then the so that's the X and then the Y axis is the uh, authoritarian libertarian. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So so I tend to be sort of like the, on the more left libertarian kind of area. I consider myself a I consider myself a liberal. Um, I don't consider myself um, out there further to the left where I think the progressives reside. Mm-hmm. Um, I I you know I voted like just full disclosure i voted for obama i'm nice you know i marched for i marched obama for the secret muslim obama the secret muslim obama hussein mm-hmm. uh yeah yeah barack hussein obama um i actually yeah i made sure to write in his middle name um and uh, you know like i vote you know i marched for gay marriage and you know i blah, 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 blah. so you know I'm, I'm 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 all about liberty and so i kind of you know, it, I think that's how I arrive at my position of, you know, I think it's totally fine that Milo was banned from a, you know, business standpoint. I totally get it. I mean, you know, as a, uh, if I was running Twitter, I would, I would probably actually cultivate and curate the content a little bit more than they do, mm-hmm. to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but I think if we're, uh, the, again, the, the premise, as far as 
I've always thought of it with Twitter was that it was this sort of freedom of speech safe space. We were talking about safe spaces earlier. It's a safe space for freedom of speech, even if that speech isn't necessarily that safe. Um, but it is until you start. Obviously, I think, and I think, I think what banning Milo is doing is that's, that's disabusing many people of this notion that Twitter is a safe space for all speech, whether that's mean speech or nice speech or whatever. And, And it's, and it's becoming more curated and it's also becoming more ideologically pure. Yes, and as an ex-Muslim, I can sympathize with that, and I worry with that, and it's a slippery slope, and all of that. I'm only, uh, you know, that's why I was on the fence, but it's that technicality where I'm like, boom, they got him. I wouldn't cry for the Ayatollah, and I wouldn't cry for Milo, and I wouldn't worry about Mo Ansar or Reza Aslan being kicked off of Twitter if they did something wrong. Sure. I'm just, you know, I'm just, I guess I'm uh, I'm just, uh, I, I heard that quote that... That quote that was um, uh, that's oftentimes mistakenly attributed to Voltaire, but once again was written by Evelyn Beatrice. Right, Holmes. that defend your I, yeah. I disapprove. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And um, you know, so yeah. I mean, I, I heard that when I was, I think, in sixth grade, and it just kind of blew my mind. I was like, "What is there any line <gasps> that crazy people can cross where you will not defend?" Right uh, I think something. we as a society have have absolutely established uh, those lines. You know, you don't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. You don't get on the radio and say hack up people with machetes. You don't get on Twitter and say, you know, this person is, uh, you know, did X, Y and Z, especially if they're making it up. Uh, go, you know send them mean pictures and mean tweets and things like that. Um, you know, being, you know, specifically targeting people and saying, you know, this, you know, and, and, and instructing other people and rallying people to a, a violent, hurtful cause. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't defend that, but yeah, you know, I, I, even if I don't like it, I will defend someone's right to say mean things, whether that's Leslie Jones, which she did. She mm-hmm. said mean things to people or whether that's Milo Yiannopoulos, who said mean things to people. Yeah, no, I will defend. That's the thing. I think I, I think you and I agree on that, except I don't have a desire to say, but look, there's other people on Twitter also violating this, uh, you know, part of Twitter terms of service and they're not banned. So therefore... It's inconsistent, so therefore Milo should, Milo, fuck, why can't I say his name? Milo should still um, be on there, you know? This is, it's like a weird place where we part. I agree with you, I agree with you, and I'm affected by those problems, and then I'm like, well, they got him. Fair and yes, square. So, I mean, so you, it's interesting that you don't you don't feel any dissonance there because you know this could easily happen to you. It has. It does. I've been it banned has. on it. I've been banned on Facebook for a yeah, year. It's going on a year now. You, you, like you and Milo are actually in the same sort of uncomfortable space here. No, this is the distinction. No, <laughs> okay. Right? That so distinction the- I was saying, like attacking ideas and attacking people, two different things. He right, routinely right. shames people, attacks people. He shared screenshots uh, that were false about people knowingly. And I attack the idea of Islam, religion, Hinduism, whatever religion I feel like criticizing that day. That's so different. I'm not hurting Islam's feelings. I'm not causing Islam uh, you know, to ha- have ruined its career. Islam is doing that on its own. Do you understand? <laughs> Uh, I understand. I, I, I mean, I, I completely understand. But I'm just, you know, from uh, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, from the I'm, I'm taking taking a larger view. It's very easy to say that both of the all of that stuff is so subjective. You know, you're saying people like, well, I'm ideas is not people. Subjective. I'm just criticizing ideas. But the people whose ideas you're criticizing might say, but you're criticizing me. I have those ideas. Yeah, but if you specifically are advocating for stoning of gay people, uh, I will criticize your ideas. Right. Things start getting really confusing because as a society, we don't approve of stoning women. But as a society, we don't approve of criticizing, you know, people who stone women, apparently. Yeah, so. we, we don't, but this is this is a problem. We should approve of criticizing Bizarre. people who stone women. Right? I agree. And this is the struggle. This is the struggle. And this is the struggle of creating that distinction between ideas and people. And mm-hmm. this is why Eli's use of Islamophobia upset me. You know, because that conflation, we fight that conflation. And here are so many people, like, grouping me and other ex-Muslims. Some ex-Muslims may be fine to be identified with uh, Milo 
in, and, you know, oh, we're all martyrs of freedom of speech or whatever. No, because he actually violated the rules. If there was a rule on Facebook saying you cannot criticize Islam and I was repeatedly warned not to do it and they took my account away, I'd be like, I can't argue against that. But there is no rule. There's anti-Christian yeah, pages sorry, all I, the time. May I, may I interrupt you? I'm sorry. Throat punch. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, metaphorical. Uh, so You have to <laughs> clarify that, not yeah, a real yeah, throat punch. Clarify. I just want to clarify like, for listeners that's, uh, you know, please listen to the entire uh, podcast and don't take what I'm saying out of context. Anyway. Just um, cut you yeah, so, throat punch out of the show and playing for people. <laughs> it's going to be what I'm known for now. I'm going to get, uh, you know, um, oh, uh, his, his, his name is escaping me, but, uh, oh, he, oh, Reza Aslan. Yeah, I'm going to get Reza Aslan. Oh, oh yeah, he's a master you. of that. Yeah. Reza Aslan is just going to take that one quote and just replay it and over and over, put it on a loop. Uh, I know, you know, if if Facebook did have a policy that says, um, you know, you can't criticize Islam, or or rather, they 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 created a policy specifically in response to you, um, I would then say, oh, well, f- then I don't like Facebook anymore. Then I would I- say the same, uh, uh, but but can you argue with the fact that they have rules and I can't do anything about it? Right now, they don't have that rule and they still ban me because people report me. But Twitter has rules and Milo's been warned against them and then he was banned. So this is so, why I don't like people grouping us all in together. Some ex-Muslims are fine with it. Yes, I understand. They feel the same. They feel it's the same fight. But I, I, I definitely don't. So I think, I think what I guess I'm trying to sort of poke you on here is this notion that what you do is objectively and intrinsically different than what Milo does. Yes. Yes. Right, and you're, and you're, yeah, and I guess what I'm saying is, is like to you, these differences are apparent and clear and objective and, and 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 quantifiable and discernible, and to me they are as well. But I'm, but the the fact remains that it is entirely conceivable that other individuals with different perspectives would come to the conclusion that you are, you know, in, in criticizing Islam, uh, you, you are being just as, you know, vile and, 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 uh, heterodox as Milo. Yes. And those you, people, you, those you, are you, people like, that you, don't, you don't understand. Think that's possible or? It's absolutely possible because okay. people cannot make the difference, but people cannot make that distinction between ideas and people. And this so, is the biggest ex-Muslim struggle. Right. And that's what I'm saying. So that, that, that difference then, so thank you. So you, you've, 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 you've agreed that that difference is subjective. And what I'm saying is because that difference is subjective, you, you have to just sort of allow all of it. It's, it's one of those situations where either all of it's okay or none of it's okay. No, none of targeting people is okay unless it is their specific dangerous views you're targeting them for, like stoning women and attacking ideas, even if it's an idea that I love. Like, I understand, like, diversity, multiculturalism in the good way, not in the cultural relativist way. And feminism, these are all ideas that I care about. If Milo were to attack them, I will defend his right to do that. If Milo were to uh, talk about how brown people are inferior, how immigrants should be banned, I'm defending. I hate what he's saying, but I defend his right to say that. But when he is targeting someone, when he is spreading falsehoods about someone, especially when there is a rule in writing against that, he has no out. I haven't done anything that he's done that violates the rules. No, well, not exactly. I, I, yeah, absolutely, and and that and that's absolutely true. But um, you know, I, I just I, I, as a sort of philosophical postmodernist, I do kind of have to put this out there that you know when you say when you say hey you know you shouldn't stone people or you you know you, hey you guy you specific guy you shouldn't stone that woman uh, you know from his perspective uh, stoning the woman is the only way to keep her out of hell or whatever. <laughs> So who yeah, are but you, he's man? advocating. He's so you're, advocating, so you're advocating violence. You're advocating basically in saying, "Don't stone that woman." You are advocating sending that woman to hell in his mind. I know, but he's crazy and he's advocating <laughs> yeah. violence. 
Right. So I mean, like, no, you but know, by, don't you draw that line of violence? If he's crazy, but from his from his perspective, he's doing the most holy and generous. He's actually being very generous. So do you want to stand behind him then as well? Uh, do I want to stand behind his ability to say, hey, we should stone that woman? Yes. A specific woman. It, yeah. Is is stoning a woman physical violence? Yes. Not then stoning no. like by joint. Then stoning no. as in with rocks and stones. Yeah, then no, obviously not. Like I know I, I don't I don't condone uh, inciting people to commit acts of violence against persons. No, I do not. OK, um, but but, you know, I, I you know, obviously um, but I'm just I'm, I think I think you can tell what I'm doing here. And I'm, I'm just trying to, to kind of, you know, tease out this this notion that, you know, what is right and wrong ultimately is somewhat subjective. But the only thing that is objective is whether or not, you know, you're actually uh, condoning violence against people or inciting people to do these things. And 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 the argument that I've heard um, the, in support of banning Milo is, oh, Milo knew what people were gonna do. Yeah, that's uh, not a Milo good argument. As I said, the only that. one he, I stand he, behind. Someone, he knew people were gonna jump on that train and I, I don't know, man, like yeah, it, it, it gets into some real technicalities, but he, he literally didn't encourage anyone to do anything. No, you really unless you consider his quote tweeting an encouragement, which we all do, so yeah, yeah. But do you actually tech- think that he didn't um, know what his no. fans would do or how his fans would behave? I don't think that, I mean, as a public figure myself and you're a public figure and you're a public figure, uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I don't think it is incumbent on an artist to, um, you know, like, for example, is John Lennon respond or uh, excuse me, is, um, oh, what's that? Salinger. Uh, yeah. Uh, J.D. Yeah. Salinger? Yeah. Thank you. Is J.D. Salinger responsible for the death of John Lennon? I mean, I guess since, like, oh, so for those who don't understand, uh, the guy who oh, read so. Catcher in the Rye shot John Lennon. So just because he, just because so, he was a phony. Because he was right, a phony. Because he was a phony. I mean, I guess I would say I would be much more convinced if he had said John Lennon's a big phony in the book as opposed to just, I don't like phonies. No, but um, even then, you know, though, I, me, even then, to, though, you can't blame like that's like Mar- oh, no, blaming but, Marilyn I, Manson for the uh, right, Columbine I mean shootings. Exactly, right. and I kind of feel like I kind of feel oh. like that Milo is being uh, Marilyn Manson here a little bit. Oh right. God, like, please! He's being, he, well, he's being he's being held responsible for the actions of. People which may or may not follow him on Twitter, which who you know who he may or may not no, have no, any. No, 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 not me. Concern. I'm not holding him. No, remember I keep saying that the only technicality I think they get him on is the screenshots. I don't agree with any other of the excuses, and I agree with you that it's a slippery slope that can be used subjectively. But the screenshots, they've got something concrete. I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I. I Yes, I, I don't think it, I, I personally don't think it's as concrete as you. But again, uh, I just want to say again that I, I think out of this, uh, out of the three of us, I'm, I'm, I'm the more fundamentalist when it comes to free speech, because I actually have had I actually have had a number of issues artistically, um, you know, where I've had to there was I, there was one time. There was one time in my professional career where I had to apologize for my art, and uh, I, 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 it was it was galvanizing. And I think that my position uh, here today is directly related to that one experience that I had, where I realized um, how pernicious. Uh, this whole thing can get when I we can start understand and relate speech. to that. Do you think Milo is a, a like a, I guess a performance artist of some sort? I absolutely do. I don't, you know, honestly, I think he says a bunch of stuff that he does not even agree with at all. Like, I don't think he, like, all the stuff he has to say about religion, I'm like, I don't, I think he just says it because, like, I, I'm, I'm, you know, personally really good friends with a, a number of flamboyantly gay men who say really awful things. As a matter of fact, I was, I'm not, I don't want to get too far into personal details, but uh, I was, you know, I was at a, a classical music performance uh, the other night, and there were a bunch of nuns there. And I was with a, a buddy of mine who, who's gay, who I guess went to Catholic school when he was a kid, and he just kept making all of these horrible jokes about nuns, and they're sitting like five feet away, and we're like, "Dude, 
please, would you? I think in our personal lives, I think that's, I mean, understandable. I know a lot of my friends make really horrible jokes as well. And, you know, I perhaps wouldn't publicly endorse those jokes, but you see the difference between making them on a platform where you have like 235,000 followers. It gives you a little bit more responsibility, right? Than chuckling privately with your friend. Sure. I mean, I think, I think, I think if Milo is guilty of anything, frankly, it's of not learning the Spider-Man lesson. Do you know what I'm talking about, Eli? No, I do not know the Spider-Man. Oh. Le- great power comes great responsibility. Boom. Ah, okay. okay. I'm so I bad like, with pop gets culture one? references. <laughs> everybody gets one. <laughs> uh, that's the uh, Family Guy Spider-Man. That's the Family Guy uh, Spider-Man. Yeah, no, abs- I mean, and I think that's largely even, and I think it's very clear from the conversation and even just listening to you that we sort of rest at the three parts of the spectrum is that Ina's sort of in the middle and she's found this technicality. She, she's got a very hard line in the sand. The quoting of the tweets with the false screenshots is why he is banned, not because of the things he said, not because of the things he did, because of the rule he broke, and she's not crying over him. She's not crying over that spilt milk. You, on the other hand, you sort of want to see this extreme exchange of ideas, and I think I fall to the left of both of you, which is I take much more seriously the things he says and the way he makes people feel, Uh, and I think it's it's really interesting. The, The only thing that I would sort of bring to the conversation um, as public figures, as people who are aware, um, and this relates, I think, maybe especially to me as someone who, again, says, who swears a lot and says very, very, very in their capacity as a comedian. And and, and forgive me for saying that because everyone who's ever called themselves an edgy comedian, I want to stab in the face. But Jesus. It, it, it's Whoa, just a, don't say that one's know, what? That's just, just an expression. You've reacted to every expression like it's a personal threat. Me? Yes. Yeah, every, no, I'm, no, no. I don't take it personally. I'm just, uh, <laughs> I guess I am not used to hearing throat punch and stab in the face. I, well, like. I apologize. So every, everyone who's ever called them, I apologize to anyone who's not used to my uh, my flavor. Uh, but anyone who's ever called themselves a quote-unquote edgy comedian has always struck me as, as slightly problematic. Uh, but for me, I think the difference between what I say as a comedian on my show, and, and I say things on my show that are way worse than anything Milo's ever said, right? I say things that are way more homophobic, transphobic, whatever, on my show in my role as a comedian than Milo's ever said. But the difference is that when when it's time for me to talk seriously, the way that I speak is this. And, and when it comes time to taking care of my uh, mm-hmm. listenership and the people who listen to me and want my actual opinions, I'm very, very careful to make sure that they get the right ideas from me, even though as a comedian, I sort of use a roast mentality, anything goes, no holds barred. And, and the problem that I really see with Milo, and this sort of comes to your Spider-Man example, Travis, is that Milo does not break character. And as a result, Mm -hmm. he has taught a bunch of people who believe him to be genuine. Now, Mm -hmm. I I would say, I agree with you, Travis. I don't think he means what he says. We're both actors. I'm a former actor. You're a current actor. I went to NYU for drama. And we both know what it looks like when someone checks their lines, right? That little look at your feet and you're like, what do I say now? And and I see him do it in every speech, right? You watch him and he's he's a mediocre to bad actor saying the things that will get him the most attention. But yep. the people who watch him don't recognize that. And, and that's what I lay at his feet, more even than the things he says. Because, again, some of the legends of comedy, Louis C.K., Doug Stanhope, you know, in the name of Milo said, but they say them in a context that we can understand them. And Milo specifically, and I believe purposefully, has not. And he is educated hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people at this point in some pretty vicious, real-world harmful beliefs. And and that's where I hold him accountable. Now, it's further to the left than um, Ina has just expressed, which is just the technicality, and way further to the left than you, which is sort of that free market of ideas. And and the truth is, when you ask me what I think the consequences for those ideas should be, it's a long and complex conversation. The answer is not shut him down. The answer is not ban him. The answer not uh, in any way legally enforce against his speech, but I do hold him responsible. And I think we're in a unique position as three people with large listenerships to talk about this because it's a problem of our generation that gets worse. You know, when, when YouTubers tweet, I wouldn't even rape you with the knowledge 
that their followers are then going to on to a rape victim and say terrible, horrible, just continuingly malicious things, if we don't at least philosophically start bearing that responsibility and understanding the power that we wield simply from something on my phone. And you know, half my tweets are like, had lunch today, but the power that we wield, I think we lose out I think we ignore, sure, I should say, I think we ignore the very real world consequences that we can enact on other people, even when we think they quote unquote deserve it. You know, and, and, and that's really where I think I fall that's to the left of either of you is that even though I hate Kevin Sorbo and Ray Comfort, I don't tweet at Ray Comfort and I don't tweet at Kevin Sorbo. But there Sorbo. would be nothing wrong if you did. The, uh, but unless you started making it like a personal attack and calling him ugly and harassing him, and but that oh, it, here we are, we're going in circles, and then we're gonna I, we're gonna talk about how yeah, was, that's so actually, vague. But we're gonna, ha- yeah, we're at the two two hour mark now. So. Yeah, I, I was just talking about personally as as a public figure and and so that philosophically at Milo's feet in the same way that I, I place it at my own. And again, like, I mean, it literally for this conversation, if I see when, when this episode released, people are like, Travis, you're so mad, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to be like, cut it out because I want to create a better environment for these conversations. And if people see that, and Travis, I hope you feel this, you will be freer to express better different ideas. And that's where I feel the true marketplace of ideas is born. Not where we ignore the hate speech, but where we protect the people, we protect people to say what they want free from hate speech. And I, I don't know if that is enough of a difference or if that even makes sense. I know I ranted a smidgen, but but that's that's the philosophy I lay at my own feet as a public figure. I think for me, um, it's just to kind of bring it back around to the top, uh, you know, getting back to our 19 year old babies and things like that. I think, you know, for me, what the Milo thing does is it uh, underscores the need for us as a culture as a society, but just to, we're having this cultural, this weird cultural moment where um, people are not expected to stand porter at the door of their own thinking. And I think that ultimately that is going to be Har- more harmful than people having harmful beliefs. I think one of the most harmful beliefs people can have is that somehow um, they are not responsible for how they react emotionally to other people's words. And um, I th- when it comes to Milo, uh, again, I disapprove of what he says, but I think he he has the right to say it. And, uh, and I mean that I mean that in a general sense, not just in the First Amendment sense. And I, my main concern with Milo, my 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 chief concern as a, as an artist is what's next? Who's next? Uh, once we start banning him because his opinions aren't popular, uh, you know, how, how far how far down are we going to whittle this thing? And that 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 I think is 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 the thing that puts the chill up my spine. Well, I think considering uh, ISIS and uh, actual Nazis are on Twitter, I don't think we have to worry about that so much. You know, uh, Milo was banned after uh, repeat. Uh, I guess, repeat incidents and repeat warnings. And this isn't really like the end of all conversation. He's not the one that symbolizes that everyone is now going to be attacked and that Twitter is, uh, you know, a liberal conspiracy to silence conservatives. I don't think so. Um, well, I just want to jump in and really quickly say that, you know, I'm, I'm fairly certain that the alt-right absolutely sees it in those exact terms. Yes. Now, Wait, that was you, Travis, right? That was yeah, that's Travis. Uh, man, us white guys sounded alike. I should have done, done the French accent. accent. Should have done the accents. <laughs> yeah, we're starting to blend a little too much. I blame you, Ina. You negated that idea. Which? Our idea of using fancy accents. Oh yeah. Our- oh, I'm sorry, but imagine how much more difficult this conversation would have yeah, been. It's so much better. <laughs> oh yeah, I oh, guess. Just to defend hate speech. <laughs> <laughs> we need Malu. Oh, it would have been great. Right. Been great. Um, well, I think we all got our um, opinions out there, and I think we can agree on some basic things. I think we'll always go in circles on some things, but at least we just hashed our ideas out. We hashed what we think are uh, critical distinctions out. We've gone in so many circles. But anyways, 
Thank you both so much for coming on, for yeah, chatting. Yeah, this was a ton of fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, both of excellent you. conversation. Uh, it was really nice to make your acquaintance, Eli and Ina. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Yeah, All and, right. uh, you know, and this is how we get the conversation moving forward, right? Not always talking to people we agree with, but we can be respectful to everyone. And uh, I do defend Milo's right to have horrible ideas, to spout those horrible ideas, but when they get them on a technicality... I'm not going to cry, as Eli said. Um, sure. Where do people find you guys? Travis, on Twitter. Well, after all these horror stories, uh, people can go to, uh, just, you know, just... Uh, I don't know if I want to get on. No, I'm at, <laughs> uh, I'm at Wester Space on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, uh, just Travis Wester. Uh, I think I have a Snapchat that I almost never use because I can't figure it out. Uh, and, uh, oh, I have an Instagram, which is also at Wester Space, which is completely free of any opinions whatsoever. It's just pictures usually of me running around Los Angeles. Nice. And Eli. I have two podcasts, uh, three podcasts, actually. God Awful Movies, uh, The Scathing Atheist, and The Skeptocrat, which are on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever else podcasts live. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at Eli Bosnick and be my fan on Facebook as well. You guys, you know, flaunting your Facebook privilege in my face, really not mm -hmm. very nice mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. oh, we triggered, we triggered. Yeah. Oh. And I licked Ray Comfort, totally got away with it, nobody cared. <laughs> you what? Mm, for another time, Ina, for another <laughs> time. <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> all right, well, a pleasure chatting with you both. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Likewise. take care. Bye-bye. Right. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of Polite Conversations. You can support this podcast by sharing the shit out of it, making some noise about it, or contributing via Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash nice mangoes. No Ian mangoes. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at nice mangoes. If you want to make a one-time donation instead of a monthly Patreon one, you can do so via PayPal. Nice mangoes dot blog at gmail.com. Remember, no Ian Mangos. If you've got an interesting story and would potentially like to be a guest, you can email me there too. A special thanks to Dylan Beck for theme music, sound, and production help. <laughs>